Give some questions before we kind of go. Okay, we're slowly coming back. Um, Council, since I can see you on my screen, Councilmember Lewis Church, can you hear me okay? Yep, I can hear you perfectly. Well, and you sound great too. Um, and I've only been one round. The, um, we were just finished with Councilmember Fruman on his second and final round. And Councilmember Parker said he had, was, were you next? No. I... <laughs> nice try. Uh, Councilmember Henderson. And then Councilmember Parker, I have, I think, two questions. Councilmember Henderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, that break was actually helpful to get some clarity on a, a couple of things. Um, but Deputy Mayor, I, I before I go to asking some questions about OST, I want to ask you about the Master Facilities Plan work. Um, so as part of PACE, most people focus on the six-year CIP for DCPS, but there was another portion of that as it pertains to the master facilities plan to encourage and entice and incentivize and require that charter schools also provide facility condition assessment information and capacity utilization information to go into that plan. Mm. Um, I wanna confirm with you that either you or DGS has actually been receiving the survey information from the charter sector. Uh, we got it. I think I'm just going to look at my team member here. We, we actually, we are, and we did. We got it for the last MFP we, and we get it now. We get it annually. Great. So everybody's been complying and such. Yes. You haven't had to um, do any fines as we allow in the law. Great. Wonderful. Um, so one of the questions I do have in terms of the boundary study piece is around how we are assessing sort of forward looking uh, capacity. So for example, um, Burroughs Elementary and Ward 5 is already in the CIP for an expansion um, and a new facility, um, but I also think they'll be getting some more ECE seats, et cetera. How are you all sort of baking that into the discussions around um, what to look for going forward from a, a, a student assignment policy perspective? Do you mean in terms of the actual number of students we anticipate, or do you mean how do we integrate the fact that we're doing an ex and a modernization and expansion of the schools? Um, in terms of the number of students you anticipate to serve. So there were, um, what we have timed this, I hope well, because we're expecting the census results through the Office of Planning to help us with our student population forecasts. Right. So that's the data that will be the, the heart of the MFP kind of capacity and utilization work that will then inform the boundary study. Okay, do we count trailers as, um, or temporary, I don't call it, temporary classrooms and or cottages, um, I think as DCPS refers to them, um, as part of uh, capacity? We don't count it as part of permanent capacity, but we do include a view of capacity that includes permanent and temporary. Okay. All right. Uh, I would love to talk more as obviously as you guys are going through that process to uh, get a little bit more insight there. Yeah, we're very happy to do that. Okay. So out of school time, uh, I was really excited that you guys have set aside 2.5 million in FY24 specifically for grants to providers for students with disabilities. This has been a big push for families um, wanting to make sure that um, recreation for all or is actually for all. Um, one of my questions is, um, will the uh, money for the grants be dispersed by the number of students those providers are um, hoping to serve? So the money right now, and we're developing this now, so happy to stay in touch with you, and thank you for your continued and passionate advocacy here. It's one of the reasons we're doing this. Um, uh, there are three different things we're planning on doing with the money. The first is actually integrating the seats into our existing grant program. So that sounds like what you've just asked about. Uh, and we'll have to determine the allocations there. Secondly, we're looking at standing up special competitions. Okay. So you might have specialty providers that you would actually give money to um, that you don't currently fund or fund for different reasons. Uh, and then thirdly, we're gonna continue our training. Our most popular trainings this year were for providers to help them figure out how to be more inclusive. I love that. And I love so that. that will be that, that's the third way in which the money will be expended. Great, great. So, um, In terms of the, the training piece, will this coincide with a development of statewide guidance or standards in terms of what providers writ large can and cannot do 
um, legally as it pertains to if a student comes or if a family presents and the student has an IP or disability? Yes, we're actually planning to start that work through our after school work. So right. our conversation earlier about the kind of quality assurance personnel, part of what they're doing is developing those standards and guidance for our aftercare providers, oh after gosh. school providers. You know, this is so great is because I introduced a bill on this very thing. And I think you're saying you already are funding it. Yes? Well, I wouldn't like to go that far, council member, but I would like, to, so find, I would like <laughs> to follow up with your office to see whether that's true or not. Okay. But this is true. It would be great, Mr. Chairman, if we could just include my bill in the BSA because they're already going to be doing that work. Um, yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, a couple of other questions. Um, second, do you just say whatever? <laughs> um, okay, so I wanted to check in regarding the Office uh, for Student DC Coordinating Committee. Um, what's the DME's role in the transfer of the high school program at the DCGL from DCPS to Maya Angelou? Uh, we play actually a very strong uh, both coordinating role and a collaborative role. We convened a task force that we co-chaired with ASI last summer to figure out what the right path forward would be here. It's actually complicated because it used to be DCPS, and then they engaged in this year extension uh, with a special purview from the DC Public Charter School Board to give Maya the opportunity to do that service, and we we're figuring out the sustainable path forward. So we co-convened a task force of government agencies, Department of Corrections, and others um, to determine what we thought was the best path forward. And that's what we've included in the budget, which is the $4 million to the Department of Corrections so they can engage in contracting. Importantly, we're also helping to draft or help to draft the slight legislative change that we need, which we included in the BSA um, that allows DOC to do this contracting directly, which is comparable to what we've done at DYRS. Okay. So who um, is responsible for the oversight then? So this is going to be, ASI will be responsible for the educational oversight. Okay. And DOC will be responsible for its grants management to ensure that they're getting the services that they're paying for, if that makes sense. Yep. All right. Um, safe passage really quickly. Were you aware that in the Department of Transportation budget, which manages the crossing guard um, and the traffic control officers, that um, this budget proposes a decrease of 30 crossing guards? I was not aware that the budget proposed a decrease of crossing guards. I'm unsurprised given that we were doing vacancy sweeps. So I know that they were having trouble staffing all of their crossing guard positions. Okay. Are you concerned at all in terms of how this will impact safe passage? I mean, I, I know that these were vacancies, but. Yeah, I would say that I assume that DDOT has what it needs to continue providing the services. That was our, our, our ongoing assessment. Uh, and I do know that schools that initially had asked for crossing guards all got them. There were some requests for additional that were not met. Okay. Uh, and so we continue to look at that and see what's possible there. But I think we'll be able to sustain the services that we're currently providing. Okay. Speaking of safe passage, does this uh, budget continue uh, School Connect? Is yes. that what it's called? DC yeah. School Connect, the, the micro transit program in words seven and eight. Yes. Uh, does this provide an expansion at all? It the, does not. It does not. We were happy to actually sustain that program at the schools that we're currently um, currently have it at. Okay. And in terms of capacity, though, are you meeting your target numbers? We are. Okay. Um, speaking of transit, adult education transit subsidy. Not um, cut. I'm sorry? Not cut. It's a mis it's, folks are misinformed about that. It got moved, but it still exists. Oh, moved to where? Uh, it moved to, what's that? It moved to WMATA from DDOT to be incorporated with Kids Ride Free. There's no change in services. I'm a, mar I'm, I'm a marionette. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So for all the adult uh, charters and, and programs that are emailing, the money can be found in WMATA included in the line item for Kids Ride Free no change in service Correct. and no cut. That's right. That's great to know. Okay, that's all right. Um, it's moving so fast. Oh, sorry. Okay, one last thing with my last minute. I just wanna say, I'm gonna ask you this question on the record just so um, folks can have the benefit of the conversation that we had in terms of the back and forth around the charter payment mm -hmm. piece. Um, so it's two years of retro pay. Um, 
what happens if, hi, I'm Christina and I work at Friendship Public Charter School this school year, but I will not be continuing my service with Friendship Public Charter School in school year 23-24. Do I get my money? So the answer is you are entitled to your money. And yes, we assume you'll get your money. What we're saying to the charter LEAs is, is that they have to make best effort to follow up with teachers that were in their employ this year, but are not in their employ next year in order to facilitate that payment process. Okay, so will the retro, um, the funding for the retro payment, will that all be in one payment? <clears throat> right now we're anticipating we'll do the funding for the retro payment in the same tranche that we do the initial payment for the go forward raises. So I think the answer to your question is yes, if I understand it. Okay, and something that Council Member Parker said, if I'm not a charter teacher this year, but I start in 23, 24, what do I get? Well, you're entitled to what we would consider to be the equivalent of a 12.5% raise off what your salary would have been this year. And this is some of the detail we have to work out with our colleagues in the charter sector, how exactly to, to measure that. Great. We cover a lot of ground. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilman Parker. I want to pick up on uh, the charter teacher pay, just one aspect, and we discussed this as well, uh, an endeavor to create a hotline or a resource center of some sort. So it's so that we're not simply taking the LEA's word for best effort of outreach to teachers to ensure that there is no loss or miscommunication. Yeah, Council Member, and I appreciated the exchange there. I want to reassure you and others that I have every belief that our Colleagues in charter LEAs will make those best efforts. Uh, I have absolute faith in them. Uh, at the same time, uh, I'm certainly happy to stand up something for teachers yes. in the way that you've described yes. uh, so that they can actually contact us or some other entity if they feel as though they are not getting what um, they deserve based on their service. Trust but verify. Trust yes. but verify. Um, I want to go to uh, school safety. And in the proposed fiscal year 24 budget, there is uh, an investment of 40 SROs. Those are dedicated police officers to our school communities. It is worth noting that we have roughly 40 SROs now. And so in many ways that is maintaining the status quo to uh, through the fiscal year 24 uh, budget. Another aspect that is a subtext to this is that we have an attrition problem at MPD. I know we're trying to account for that, but what I read that is, is we're gonna fund up to 40 FTEs or SROs. That's no guarantee that we will actually have 40 SROs. We could have 35, we could have 30, depending on how attrition goes. That said, how is your office uh, thinking about compensating for school safety, knowing that we aren't going above 40 SROs, best case scenario, and we actually may have fewer than 40 SROs, worst case scenario. Uh, thanks, Council Member. We have a, you're asking an incredibly important and very complicated question. We have done a lot of work. In fact, I've seen your draft legislation and feel like we're actually covering much of the ground that you have there. So I'd love an opportunity to sit down with you and, and you sure that. Uh, provide perspective on the legislation? Any thoughts? <clears throat> we, we are, like you, we have the exact same values. We are passionately committed to ensuring young people are safe in school uh, as they travel to and from school and in community. And a lot of what you have uh, included there is work that's already underway, uh, some of some completed and some in process. And so, um, so I would say- sounds like, is that an endorsement or you're open to the- aspects of the legislation? I am very open to engaging with you, and I hope we'll be able to do that, to share specific perspectives and aspects of it that I think might be um, helpful and, and others that might be redundant. Um, I, I will share with you, uh, personally, I don't ever think it's a good idea to legislate specific roles in schools um, for reasons that I'm happy to to go into where you don't know specifically what the roles are, what they'll do, whether the principals are in favor of them and so on and so forth. So I think that's something we could talk a little bit more about. In general, the spirit of your legislation is something that I, I deeply support and have been working very extensively on. We've convened uh, with HCMA and agencies across the government. We're redeveloping our playbooks for every school on their own safety protocols. We've got new communication protocols in place. We're hardening schools. Uh, we're focused on developing perspectives on conflict resolution programming and all the preventative work that needs to happen in schools. Uh, we're focused on ensuring that all of our security officers have the right training and levels of training, which is something I know that you 
uh, that you care about as well. And so, um, and so we are doing a lot of work in this area. Yep. One more, I, I, I guess what troubles me is two things. One, there are a lot of school leaders and teachers that think SROs are coming back, quote unquote. I keep hearing this phrase, bring SROs back or SROs are coming back or the mayor is proposing to bring SROs back. And we just need to be very honest with people that, but in the fiscal year 24 budget, SROs are not coming back any more than they already are in our schools or present. Um, connected to that, in the absence of an alternative, like the one I put forward, I'm just unclear what we're gonna do to address school leaders' concerns around school safety. I recently had a meeting with Ward 5 school leaders and similar to what you shared, they all talked pretty plainly about school safety. And if we know we have an attrition problem and I, I didn't see any other investments in direct school safety, I'm not talking about safe passage work, I'm just unclear what we're doing to address school leaders' needs to keep yeah, school community safe. Again, in my opinion, this is exactly the right line of question to go down because we're all appalled by the level of violence we're seeing in our communities and 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 uh, and some of the, the the violence we're seeing amongst our students. I think, in part, the answer, excuse me, the question goes to LEAs, and you engage with schools all the time. It'll be an important conversation for you to have, obviously, with the chancellor who's coming next. Um, I engage with charter LEAs all the time in this. They have many of their own security personnel have been investing and over-investing in, in, uh, in safety personnel for their schools. Um, we know uh, that we have got, as a city, more investments going into some additional schools for the ones, Leadership Academy, as another example, and two more schools that we're, we're engaged with. Uh, we've got Violence Interruption as a program across the city and Safe Passage, as you mentioned, some of which is intended to be in-school programming, so not just outside, but also in school. So there are there is more work that we are doing to ensure the safety of our of our young people. Okay, uh, more to come on that. I am hopeful that we can make progress on the legislation I introduced, and I would love to have you as a partner and moving that forward, or some other alternative to just meet the real concern that school communities have. Be happy to engage with you. Uh, I know DCBS is coming up next, but. I've heard uh, discrepancies in the gap in terms of where school budgets are funded and the proposed, or actually not proposed, but the legislation um, that the council put forward. Um, I, according to the chairman's numbers, it's roughly 30 million, and I'm sure he'll get to that. I heard from those on the executive side as closer to 10 million. Can you Can you just articulate how you all are coming up with that number. And I know you may not necessarily agree um, that it's possible to meet the aspects of the school first budgeting approach from the chairman, but how, how, how are you landing on 10 million as the gap from last year's budgets to this year's current budget? If I understand it correctly, the, the 10 or $11 million number you're using is the, is the straight up hold harmless number? So it, it's uh, it's not the equivalent, I don't think, of what's legislated at one, <clears throat> which would be effectively 1.0505% of last year's budget, uh, but it's simply hold harmless. I think the complexity here, which I know that Chairman and I have talked quite a bit about, is it's hard to know what you would be allowed to take out of school budgets for the educational reasons that are allowed in that line. So in the in the in the and the second thing that I would share, if I may, um, council member, is that the legislation also doesn't doesn't cause you to increase school budgets beyond a certain point. It allows it, but it doesn't cause that to happen. And so there is you could also argue that the schools collectively are funded at the level that they're required to by the legislation. We've just chosen to put the money in higher degrees in some schools over others. I'm sure the chairman is gonna go at length about uh, uh, DCPS honoring the law. I just wanna get a sense of the gap. So if you all are saying 10 or 11 million, that is because um, and, and that is different than 30 million if the council's budget mm -hmm. office is projecting that number, let's say. Um, you're suggesting that's probably because of what line items are being 
um, backed out of the school budget numbers? In part, but, but also if you simply wanted to hold all schools at last year's funding levels, we think that would cause you to come to 10 or $11 million. In other words, hold harmless at 100%. Okay. And again, that's different from the legislation, which says you have to inflate I got you. budgets by a certain percentage. Uh, I did want to... Oh, I'm sorry, I'm being corrected. Let me correct myself. Yeah, it's not just 100. It actually gets you to the, um, it gets you to the 105%. So, okay. So if you do the straight up number math, that's, that's, that's what I'm going to... I'm going to end here. The adult weight and at-risk weight analyses that you all are looking forward to doing. Um, can you just speak more about that? Um, so you talked about the UPSFF working group in your pre-response hearing, um, your responses, and you talked about needing to do further analysis on a, an adult weight and at-risk weight. Mm. Yeah, so thanks for the question. Um, one of the most wonderful things about our public education system is our adult schools and our adult charter yes. schools. So I wanted to start by acknowledging their extraordinary work and how much we value it. The question has come up about whether the, the, the weight should be moved from 0.9 or 0.91 of the foundation level weight to 100%. Um, and I would share with you that as we did the UPSFF working group, that recommendation came in loud and clear from adult charter operators. And we listened and we heard, we did not have the level of analytic rigor that would allow us to understand the cost base. These are schools that I think by everyone's admission does part-time education of adult students. And so therefore the question is, well, what's the right foundation level weight to give these schools that do part-time work? They would share back that they don't have access to some of the other weights uh, and attributes that go to the K-12 system. And so therefore you're kind of balancing it all together by just putting it at, at 1.0. And what we have said, uh, and what I've committed to is, we're gonna look at the cost structure more carefully in the adequacy study and make a final recommendation on this okay. because we just want to understand and make sure that the schools are getting exactly what they need in order to do the fine work that they continue to do. They, they did get the 5% increase in the UPSF as did everybody. So it's not as though they were um, held back from that, but we did not uh, in this budget proposal increase the weight to 1.0. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Lewis George, did you have a second? I don't think you've had a second round yet. No, I haven't, Chairman. So why don't you proceed? You might have heard me urge colleagues to read limit their questions. That's right. I'm only going to get to the questions that have not been asked and answered. Excellent. Thank you. Um, uh, w. Mayor, I want to ask uh, some questions about the master's facilities plan um, as it relates to um, the facilities portion of this and my uh, role over uh, DGS uh, as uh, facility share. One of the goals of the 2023 master's degree plan is to, and I quote, ensure every student's daily experience is in a well-maintained facility. What is, uh, what role are you all having DGS play in achieving this goal? Will the report include budget recommendations for things like maintenance and HVAC repairs? If not, what is expected of the report related to this goal? I really want to appreciate the fact that you have raised this as a very important signature part of the master facility plan. And we have engaged DGS already and plan to as core partners in this work. Um, what we're intending is to come up with a set of recommendations about how to ensure our work in city government leads to well-maintained facilities. Okay. And what I mean by that is you could imagine there is some either process recommendations or accountability recommendations. You can imagine what that might look like. And I am sure as the chair of the committee, council member, we'll be engaging you uh, on this as well as we go along. I think it's unlikely that we come up with specific budget recommendations in this report. I don't think we're planning on doing that across any of the areas of work. Uh, so I think that's unlikely, if I'm honest. Uh, but we do plan on having uh, recommendations that get us to very well-maintained facilities across the city. Okay, great. Um, I look forward to working in partnership with you and through uh, and DGS because uh, I do think that's a, a a good part uh, that we need to address within the within the plan. Um, I want to ask about, and I hope I'm saying this right, is the PTOW data system? Yeah, we refer to it as the Education to Employment data system. It's sometimes referred to as a P20W system, which is a little, uh, bit, little, bit, little bit wonky. 
Thank you, P20W data system. Why is this being housed at DME rather than mm -hmm. OSI? Uh, if the intention is that DME incubate this before moving into OSI later on, sort of what is the timeline and why is that the plan? Yeah, so there are two, I think, important responses to that question. The first is, as we looked at the other states, and there are more than 20 that have developed these systems to help provide this kind of important insight, uh, one of the best practices that we identified was that you initially need to house these systems in a neutral location and not in any of the agencies that's providing data. Uh, and that's to avoid um, any, uh, you know, you're trying to keep the whole system okay, yeah. neutral. And okay. so that's why we're starting it in DME. Uh, we actually initially thought we would we would want to do it at OSI or as part of the OSI right. data system, but that did not turn out to be feasible. So we're starting it here. And yes, we have a history of incubating these things, and but we don't intend for DME to be the long-term home, but we would look collectively across all of the agencies about the right home for this. Okay. DOES has a data works project that's ongoing that could be a, a home. OSI, of course, has its own longitudinal right. work. That could be a decent home, or we could find a different location for it. Okay. Understood. I think that's fair. I, I was thinking Aussie because it has longitudinal, uh, that longitudinal whole, the home that you spoke of would be um, a part of that. Will there be a mandate for all LEAs to contribute to data? If not, why not? Uh, that's a good question. My own answer is yes, we would want to do something like that because otherwise we won't get the value from the system. That's right. Uh, and so I would say, um, I would say we would do that. Um, right now, uh, we do have mandates of LEAs contributing all kinds of data into OSI, and that's our primary go-to for the K-12 portion of this of this data system that we're connecting. And so I don't yeah. anticipate any problems, but I can't speak for certain right now that we're getting everything that we would want from all LEAs, and so we'd have to look carefully at that. Okay. Yeah, in order for this to do the work that we needed to do and for it to be effective, um, I think we're going to have to put a mandate in for all LEAs. Um, but I hope you will you will follow you will sort of as you go determine what what that policy should look like. I am in favor of of, of doing it so that we can get the best uh, results from this. Um, and then the P twenty W data system is budgeted to have four hundred and twelve thousand and one and a half FTEs and operating expenses plus 3.5 million in fiscal year 24 and 25 capital expenses. What is the timeline for this project moving forward? Two years. Two years, okay. It's a two year build. We anticipate at the end of two years, we'll have the um, initial ability to produce the reporting that we're excited about. Um, I didn't mention earlier, also how excited the RPP is about this. Okay. We've already, we've already partnered with them and there were some initial questions I know about what's the relationship, but they have established as a priority understanding what happens to students after they leave our system. And this is a, a data system that will allow us to answer some important questions alongside the RPP. Okay. Um, I, I, okay, I appreciate that. And, and that sounds exciting. I'm, I'm really excited about, uh, about that. Um, I think it's, we're gonna end up with a good result here. Um, I wanted to ask uh, back to facilities for a second. I I've pushed, you know, for the last three years for DCPS uh, uh, and the mayor to purchase or lease additional space to relieve ward force overcrowding and swing space limitations. Um, previously, we've been told DCPS doesn't lease or lease space or that other options are available. Um, so I'll ask it again because I haven't seen the evidence that DME, DCPS, or whoever is supposed to be doing this work that it's really happening. Um, here are some examples of, of locations I think should be explored um, within the facility <laughs> because we do have uh, ever-growing um, populations uh, in, in our school system, uh, specifically uh, our Whittier, Coolidge, IW Wells. Um, we're expanding the cafeteria. We put $9 million in the budget, uh, last year's budget for the cafeteria at Coolidge because of the overcrowding between Wells and, Cool uh, Wells and Coolidge and the population is only growing and they're gonna reach capacity soon and we will need more space. Um, and then obviously Lafayette. And so um, areas, some locations that I would like you all to explore is the former Christian Post building uh, at 6200 Second Street Northwest. Uh, uh, the zip goes 20011. Uh, the Albright Memorial Methodist Church which is at 409 Rittenhouse Street Northwest. Uh, both of those uh, locations could be uh, able to assist the overcrowding and that is about to occur and is occurring for Ida B. Wells, Coolidge, uh, and the Whittier School Pipeline. Um, and then the Episcopal Center for Children uh, for Lafayette Early 
childhood. Um, and so uh, we've sent these uh, in the past. Um, so I know you are aware of them, but as we look at facilities and we look at crowding and overcrowding, uh, I, I wanna make sure that um, you all will uh, commit to exploring those options. Well, I will let, um, Councilmember, thanks for your view on that. I will let the chancellor respond on the Episcopal. Okay. Say, Cause he, I know has been in discussions with them or his team has. On the other ones, I don't think I am aware of conversations about yet purchasing um, satellite schools for any of the campuses that you've described. Um, if in our boundary and feeder pattern study, we determine you know, with our projections that there's gonna be um, overcrowding in the near future, of course, we will be looking for solutions. And it sounds like you've got some, uh, some already ready to recommend. So we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll take a look at them in that context. Yeah, I will, I will send you our letter from spring 2021 um, and uh, I would uh, like to work with you to continue to look into this. Um, and then uh, I want to note my support for Councilmember Parker's line of questions and concerns around our approach to safety in our schools um, and uh, working together to uh, uh, what, what, what Councilmember Parker has proposed uh, as a way for us to really ensure the safety that we are hearing from students and school leaders uh, in Ward 4 and, and across the city um, to be able to address those communities. So I want to um, note that. Uh, and with that, I will yield the rest of my time back to the chairman. Thank you. Well, thanks. Thanks, Councilman. Just on your on your safety point at the end, this is an area where we all have to work extremely closely together. Uh, so That's I, right. look to, I will look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Um, <clears throat> I had two questions. Um, Councilmember Henderson, I think, asked you about the um, education in the jail. Is it appropriate that the Department of Corrections would be an LEA? Is an important legal distinction here about whether or not they would be an LEA or simply responsible for this part of service provision for, for the youth who are receiving special education services in the, in the jail? So yes, it's appropriate in my opinion, and it's certainly the practice in many other jurisdictions that the local jail has contracting authority and has oversight over the service provision. It's important that there be an MOA with ASI, which we also intend and are, and are working on, that they've got oversight of the quality of that educational provision. So it is appropriate that the state agency has a role to play in ensuring that this is of a good quality. So then who's the LEA? In this instance, it would be basically the Department of Corrections would act as um, would act as something that has the role of an LEA without necessarily legally being defined in that way. There's some legal nuance here um, that we uh, that we can we can talk with you about. And, and so the UPSFF funding <clears throat> goes to this would be this would be um, so we're, we're, we have included money for the contract in this, and the DOC would be the public agency responsible for the educational provision legally, and they would be given money by the city through the line item that we've established in order to provide that education. Okay, so the UPSFF next year goes up by fifty percent. ECPS gets 50% more money. The charter sector gets 50% more money. The school at the jail gets. We will we'll adequately fund the school. No, 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 no. Do they get the 50% increase in the UPSFF? If that's what they need, yes. Or are they getting a contract amount? No, they, they will get the, the whole. We will, we will do this as we do it at DYRS currently, where they are given money that's they need in order to adequately educate their, their sure students. but i'm my question has to do i'm trying to better understand the lea rule role so when we increase the upsff friendship public charter school gets its share of the increase ecps gets its share of the increase the contractor for the jail doesn't get their share of the increase they get whatever the contract amount is but the contract amount will be an amount that is required to provide the services. And we will present that in our budget as a line item in our I'm budget. I'm not suggesting it's and, inadequate. I'm just trying to figure out whether they would then get, I guess maybe, what, will the contractor for the jail get the UPSFF, be funded based on the UPSFF? 
Uh, they're actually funded above what's required in the UPSFF because you're talking about very special circumstances and facilities. These are students with special needs. So they would be funded, incarcerated. They would be funded based on a negotiated contract amount. They are funded based on what we believe as a city they need to pay a provider yeah, to no, get the I services. Do. So but that was my question. They'll get funded based on what was negotiated as a contract amount. But you're saying negotiated no, as though the negotiation precedes the need assessment. Contracts are negotiated. We're giving, we're giving the DOC money in order for it to do a solicitation in by order a, to contract. By a calculation outside of the UPSFF. I'm not saying Correct. that's wrong. I'm just trying to understand. Yeah. Okay. By a, an, what did I just say? An amount out? Outside the UPSFF. UPSFF. Right. Okay mostly because it requires more money to do this work. I had another piece to that. I can't remember now. The, um, what's the status of the contract negotiations with the WTU with the next contract? Uh, I think that's a question better answered by the chancellor. I'm not being uh, difficult about that, but I, uh, I don't want to, I don't think I have the latest update for you. Okay. Let me just say I ask because I think that it is very problematic for purposes of this budget that the last CBA negotiated in December, or November um, was four years overdue. And I would like to see the next CBA on time. I agree with you. So no other questions? Thank you. Thank you uh, there are several things I trust you took notes. You want me to go over what you're going to get back to us, Ron, with? Uh, no, I believe we'll have that covered, sir. Okay. I'll be waiting by my mailbox tomorrow. You said tomorrow? I said tomorrow. Very good. I hope you enjoy your wait. Thank you, Chairman. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Council Members. Uh, we will turn now to the District of Columbia Public Charter, uh, Public Schools, and uh, Dr. Lewis Farabee, the chancellor, will be testifying. the great thing on Move second. Give me another second.
Good afternoon, Chancellor. When you're ready, please proceed. Good afternoon, Chairman Anderson, Committee of the Whole. My name is Dr. Louis D. Fairby. I have the honor of serving as Chancellor of the District of Columbia Public Schools. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to come before the Council to discuss Mayor Bowser's fiscal year 24 budget. As a district, uh, we have seen over the last three years in responding to and recovering from the pandemic, uh, that we have made significant investments to ensure that we are able to reopen safely, advance a steady recovery, and to stabilize our school communities, uh, and to support our students with the greatest needs. I am pleased to share today that the investments that we have made in our schools are working. Over 60% of our students who receive high impact tutoring or attend the DCPS Acceleration Academy began last year well below grade level. By the end of the year, nearly 60% moved up at least one grade level in math and over 50% moved up at least one grade level in reading. While we're excited to see these early results, we know that the recovery from a once in a lifetime global public health emergency takes time and sustained focus. Further, DCPS is the only public school system in the region to grow its student population post pandemic with our highest enrollment since 2007. A strong public education system is the cornerstone of a thriving community, and we're proud to support the mayor's vision for DC's comeback. DCPS school funding model puts students first by explicitly driving funds to students who need it the most. At the same time, our model balances our shared value of stability in several ways. Stabilizing schools at 95% of their fiscal year 23 budgets, inclusive of one-time funds, and performing key checks to ensure sufficient funds are allocated for cooperations. This allows us to continue to stabilize our schools with enrollment declines while also adequately supporting growing schools such as Coolidge and Woodson High Schools. Further, to support our continued recovery, and from the impacts of the pandemic, our model adds an additional $10 million through the Mayor's Recovery Fund to DCPS to ensure a thoughtful step down of recovery dollars. Additionally, since initial budgets were released, DCPS allocated an additional $9.6 million directly into school budgets during the budget development process. These additional funds are reflected in our school submitted budgets and are available on the dcpsbudget.com website. We also have posted a downloadable spreadsheet of all the fiscal year 24 submitted school budgets. At the school level, we're seeing our investments increase in schools by more than $35 million for fiscal year 24. This means 233 more full-time employees in our schools, and specifically 114 more teachers who will be compensated at highly competitive rates, reflecting their critical role in our students' future. To deliver on our commitment to equity, DCPS allocated $11.4 million in at-risk dollars on top of the $73 million allocated to schools through the uniform per student funding formula. An example of how our model is working can be seen at Moton Elementary School, where 90% of the students served by the school have a designated at-risk status. Funds that flow through our model supports Moton's stability and ability to offer high-impact tutoring, intensive support to every single student. With a similar student body, there's another example in Stanton Elementary School, which is hire additional staff to better meet the needs of their students. And across DCPS, schools are able to fund partnerships with trusted tutoring organizations and pay their own staff to provide tutoring as well. 
Over 100 of our DCPS schools are currently providing high impact tutoring. As I've said before, no amount of money is too big as an investment for our young people. At the same time, the economic realities we're facing as a city dictate that some schools will experience decreases in their overall school budgets next year. I want to be clear, there are three reasons in which schools would see a decline in their budget. First reason is because the school is projected to have a decrease in their overall enrollment that justifies a decrease in funding. The second reason is because the school is projected to serve a population that will have fewer needs for special education, language acquisition, and services for students who meet the definition of at risk. Even if overall enrollment is increasing. The third reason is because as a city and as a district, we must thoughtfully step down one-time funds related to pandemic recovery to avoid drastic fiscal cliff in fiscal year 25. I am so thankful as a city, even in a tough budget year, we all agree on the importance of supporting our public schools. I believe that we have more in common than we disagree on, and DCPS looks forward to continuing our work with the council in service of our students and our shared values of stability and equity. Mayor Bowser's fiscal year proposed budget also includes $2.71 billion in funding for DCPS within the District Capital Improvement Plan, also known as the CIP, to design and construct modernized buildings and improve school facilities through small capital projects. We are thankful that this administration and the council continue to prioritize modernizing our school district infrastructure and improving schools across the district. Our staff and students are deserving of these state-of-art facilities that create joyful conditions for teaching and learning and spark students' intellectual curiosity. In alignment with the Planning Actively for a Comprehensive Education Facilities Amendment, also known as the PACE Act, DC was a, DCPS was able to add three new modernization projects in the CIP for fiscal year 24 to 29, which includes Beers Elementary School in Ward 7, Excel Academy in Ward 8, and Bruce Monroe at Park Elementary School in Ward 1. In addition, DCPS will utilize funds for additional construction and infrastructure projects that will have a transformative effect on our ability to provide high quality education to all of our students, including a cafeteria reservation for Plummer Elementary School in Ward 7, Hardy Middle School in Ward 2, and Coolidge High School in Ward 4. Dining and physical education space at the Kenilworth Swing Space in Ward 8, and upgrades to DCPS technology infrastructure in schools, including completing our refreshment of smart board technology systems in the classroom. $6 million in upgrades and enhancements to the school life safety hardware, including interior keys, and investing $30 million in the development and support of swing spaces district wide which will allow us to remain on track for our ongoing modernization work. In closing, I would like to share a few examples of how critical services from our citizen services team is being provided. Every day, our team works in service of our students in managing cooperation such as safety, security, student data systems, attendance and enrollment, and family engagement. Our central services team also supports students' academic experiences by writing curriculum, managing grant funding, and supporting key partnerships that enrich programming daily. DCPS is especially proud of our central services cluster support model, which was launched in the fall of 2019 to increase coordinated direct support to schools. Each of our 116 schools are strategically grouped into nine clusters each led by an instructional superintendent and supported by a cluster support team of experts in the fields of literacy, math, special education, operations, attendance, and restorative practices. The cluster support team members provide direct services, coaching, professional learning experiences, and alignment with school needs and goals. Last year, our services provided 10,000 visits from our cluster support team members. These visits included model lessons, data analysis, direct coaching, and professional development sessions. Each year, we measure 
principal perception of the model to gather feedback and to drive improvements. Feedback about the model has been overwhelmingly positive. As of fall 2022, 77% of our principals agree that the cluster support team coordinates effectively to provide integrated supports to their school. Thank you to the Committee of the Whole for its continuous partnership as we work together to invest in our students and our collective future. I am so proud to lead an incredible school system of district that is filled with vibrant and brilliant minds, ambitious students that are dedicated to excellence, along with teachers that are also dedicated to excellence and school leaders that are phenomenal. And a central services team that works tirelessly to ensure that we have joyful learning experiences in our classroom, and more importantly, all DCPS and DC students have a fair shot. I'm happy to answer your questions at this time. Uh, thank you, Chancellor Farabee. The uh, most recent park results overall, what percentage of DCPS students were at level four, level five? Well, over the pandemic, we saw uh, greater declines in performance in math compared to where we were pre pandemic. Uh, so, for example, we were down approximately 10 percentage points of proficiency in math and then 4.5% in ELA. So, what percentage of students uh, were level four? We'll have to get you the exact numbers between level four and level five. But again, we saw again. Well, how about the two together? Give me a sense. Excuse me? Give me a sense. 80% of kids in DCPS tested level four or five. I would have to, so again, those numbers I gave you were the numbers for proficiency. And I can give you those numbers again. So again, you, you give me the change. I'm asking what the total is. So for example, the proficiency in ELA was 33%. I can't remember. Proficiency is level five. No, proficiency would include both level four okay. and five. 33%. Uh, the mission of the DC public schools is to ensure, ensure that every school guarantees, guarantees that students reach their full potential, full potential through rigorous and joyful learning experiences provided in a nurturing environment. Is DCPS achieving its mission? DCPS is achieving its mission. We have been progressing steadily in our performance. And we're one of the few school districts. And one in three students is proficient in ELA. Yeah, but DCPS is also one of the few school districts that have maintained is the level of performance. DCPS ensuring that every school guarantees that students reach their full potential. May I finish my thought, please, sir? Well, you're giving me a comparative answer, but that wasn't my question. I'm not asking how DCPS compares with other schools, other school districts. I'm deeply concerned that our public school system is not meeting its mission. And uh, I just thought I would start out with that note. Yeah, well, again, I'm giving that information to give examples of the progress that's been made about, in DCPS. What's proficiency in math? So the proficiency in math in the post-pandemic era has been 22%. But again, prior to the pandemic, both in math and reading, we saw significant gains over the years in both math and literacy performance. Sure. sure. So math may have been 30% before the pandemic. That's one in three, as opposed to um, one-fifth, it'd be one-third. And English might have been 40%. That's, that's still not even half. Um, how do you justify cuts? to schools like Ron Brown, which is, if the law, as you know, requires that every school next year gets the amount of money that they got this year, plus an inflationary factor with some adjustments. But instead, Ron Brown Middle School is going to be shorted $770,000. Now it's a moment down. 
projected enrollment went down by 20 students. Middle school, right? So it's six, seven, eight, three grades. Yeah, Ron Brown is a uh, uh, high school. Uh, and then Ron Brown, they experienced a, a significant decline in their enrollment. Yes, 20. The projected enrollment dropped by 20 for next year. Correct. But again, okay. they it's not even the classroom size. Classroom Correct. size is 25. But they so, could have also had declines in enrollment from previous years as well, which would have um, produced one-time funding that we're in the process of stepping down. Um, well, let me see. That's not what this is, the law requires. The law does say if the enrollment drops next year equal to a class, but 20 is not equal to a class. Um, so their enrollment went down. I mean, these are the figures we were given. Their enrollment goes down by 20, but their budget goes down by $770,000. How is that school going to meet the mission of ensuring that every school guarantees students reach their full potential when they're being cut $770,000? How about Kelly Miller? All right, so I've goofed when I said Ron Brown was a middle school, but I'm pretty sure Kelly Miller is a middle school. Their enrollment down, went down by 28. And let's just assume that the 28 are all in one class. That would be one teacher. But their budget, compared to schools first, is going down by $882,000. How is that school going to ensure that its students reach their full potential? And again, in many cases, as I mentioned earlier, school enrollment may have declined in previous years as Kelly Miller enrollment was down in 21-22 school year by approximately 49 students. Uh, and so again, they may no, have received- 28. The figures we were given was 28. I'm giving the previous year, the 21-22 school year. So for, as I said earlier, for example, if we look at some schools enrollment, we can only, we can't look at their enrollment in just one year. We look at their enrollment over time because they could have received one-time funding. Well, but that's not that's the law. Their, understood. The, the law does say going forward that you could look at that where you are reducing the classroom because of a change in enrollment, only if you have to reduce a classroom or grade. Um, yes, going forward. But so if you want to go there with that argument, let's take Anacostia High School. Anacostia's high, high school's enrollment has dropped by 61% in 10 years. I think I asked this question of the mayor when she presented the budget March 22nd. Do you, March 24th, do you want to see Anacostia close? No, absolutely not. Okay, I don't either. I don't either. How is that school going to turn around when its budget keeps getting cut? So for next year, its budget compared to schools first is going to drop by $899,000, almost $900,000. Losing $900,000, yes, its projected enrollment is going to drop by 51. For a cumulative decrease of 61% over 10 years. Chancellor, what is your plan to turn around Anacostia? Well, I want to be clear, in a lot of the schools that you referenced, Anacostia included, uh, they have had the ability to request dollars as a part of our budget assistance process, and many of those schools have been allocated additional dollars as part of our budget assistance. For example, uh, Anacostia received an additional $118,000. Uh, Anacostia is one of our schools that is deepening their relationship in a partnership with uh, UDC, uh, and as a part of that partnership, we're now uh, offering students the ability to only earn their high school diploma, but also to earn uh, an associate's degree uh, from UDC as well. Um, they've been a longtime partner in our uh, law enforcement academies and many other career and technical education opportunities. And they were also a part of our first phase of high school redesign, uh, along with Baloo High School as well. Uh, we have seen uh, tremendous interest uh, in uh, the redesign programming. Uh, and Anacostia has also seen uh, some increases in their enrollment over that time period as well. Ooh, their enrollment has dropped by 61%.
in the last since when? In the last 10 years, it's dropped by 61%. It's, it's enrollment next year is projected to be. I don't have that number. You can say in the last 10 years, you said? Yes. Okay. So it used to have, I believe, over 600 students. It now has under 300 for next year, under 300. So you mentioned these programs. I think it's great what UDC is trying to do with Anacostia. It's enrollment is dropping. It, 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 if the enrollment keeps dropping, you, it can't, you can't sustain it. I asked you before, or I'll say it again rhetorically, is the plan to close Anacostia? I would hope not. I think you don't want to close it. It keeps losing enrollment, and it's not sustainable. How is it going to grow its enrollment when it should, under the current law, be getting another $800,000, excuse me, $900,000? It's almost a million dollars. Well, so the numbers that you're quoting as part of what's in the law, we, we don't, I don't have those numbers. You could. Yeah, as you know, we reached out to your office. I'm asked to meet with you on January 5th so that we could go over the law and how to implement it. Once we got the numbers on March 22nd, we ran the numbers, happy to share them anytime with your, your folks. I don't know how that will change anything for this budget that's before us, but under Schools First, the concept is real simple. What Anna Costia has this year is its budget next year, plus an inflationary factor, which is 5%. But that's not what they got. They got $900,000 less. And if I sound a bit angry about it, I am, because a school like Anacostia is hurting as a result of this decision. I'm out of time, but I'm going to just close with this. Let's take Bard. Bard was a gem of a new high school east of the river. It's not exactly a selective uh, um, application school, but it's supposed to be a specialized high school that attracts kids. Its enrollment is dropping by 114 kids next year. I think that's one fourth of its student body. That's not sustainable. And its budget is being cut by 610,000. Who's next? Councilmember Robert White here. Councilmember Fruman. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman Mendelson. I actually share the deep concern around Anacostia. Um, I, I think it's not possible to close Anacostia. It would be criminal to close Anacostia. I think I may come at it a little bit differently. Um, it seems clear to me that we need to invest significantly in Anacostia to make sure that it's offering everything it possibly can to the students in that community. And some of all the conversation earlier about parity with the charter sector and everything has to pass through the UPSFF, I think it actually makes that a harder thing to do. And yet, as a city, I believe that we have an obligation to ensure successful schools in every community. So uh, I, I think the Anacostia example should be top of mind in in how we think about investing in schools and the differences in situations. A different thing about Anacostia, and I don't know how this fits into how you do your budget modeling, is that Anacostia, I haven't looked at the data for the most recent years, but there was a time when 30% of the kids who were there in October were gone by May, and 30% of the kids who were there in May had arrived since October. And the challenge that our schools in low-income communities where there is enormous mobility is really daunting. And I wonder how you deal with that challenge when you think about the budget models. Yeah, so it's, it's a great question, council member. And again, I do want to reiterate my, my support and desire to continue to provide a strong instructional program at Anacosta High School. Uh, I believe our strategy to, to redesign the career technical education programs reflect the interest and needs of families, uh, which I think is important uh, to have those voices and perspective drive the way we think about what we offer. Uh, and as a result, there's been greater interest and I also think more students uh, are engaged and as a result are 
earning industry certifications and ability to go to work right out of high school if they choose to do so. Uh, and so those are the types of, of things that we're proud of, but we know we still have uh, more work to do there. Uh, and um, I have been proud to support Principal Haith and his leadership at Anacosta High School. But as you pointed out, as the system of right, uh, we do see fluctuations in enrollment throughout the year. Uh, we do set aside dollars as a part of our enrollment reserve uh, to provide additional resources as needed if there are needs that we uh, determine are needed throughout the school year. Uh, and we also, as I mentioned earlier, have a rich cluster support model as well. Uh, that also provides services to the school throughout the year to support them. I think one area to call out that is important, if I have a moment, is, is the work that they have done at all of our high school with our ninth grade academies, ensuring that students get off to a strong start in ninth grade and are able to earn the appropriate credits to transition from ninth to 10th. So, well, thank you for that. And, and I, I bring it up because in one way, it underscores the difference between the sectors and the difference, particularly in the setting of Anacostia, which is a matter of right high school in a, in a community with a lot of needs. And that's, it's a different experience than the ones at the nearby, many of the nearby charter schools where they see students leave during the course of the year, but don't see students arrive. But being the matter of right system is different and will require different resources. Um, I want to I want to pivot back also to the park scores because I have to believe when I, when those park scores came out, when everybody's heart broke, right? I mean that that where we are, it, it compared to uh, to other cities, maybe we're doing okay. Compared to the charter sector, I think actually DCPS outperformed the charter sector. It used to be that the charter sector outperformed DCPS, but in the latest results, DCPS outperformed the charter sector. But still, where we're at, where we're at and for particularly our low-income students is heartbreaking. It has to be heartbreaking right. for you. It, it is so wrong. Uh, you're correct around your assessment of the DCPS data in comparison. Uh, the citywide data, um, but but we still know that there's a lot of work to be done. I think what what we can point to is our steady progress. Or well, we've seen progress, as I mentioned earlier, from um, post pandemic of of students growing throughout the year as a result of our intensive focus on students who need the most support. Uh, and there's also other measures. I want to be clear that Park is not the only measure of success. Uh, I think we have other data points to point to, uh, such as, you know, our AP participation rate, students passing AP tests, um, other uh, assessments that we use to measure progress. And so I think if you look at the whole body of our work, uh, there's many areas that we can point to that represent our spirit of continuous improvement. So, and I, I hear about that, but I think for me as an advocate and for us as a council, one of the things that's a source of frustration is that for the last 10 years, we've been told every year it's better than the last year, and yet here's where we are. Now, that's not all on you. You haven't been here for all of that time, but it does feel like given the enormous amount of money that we're investing in all the, the sweat and tears, we should be doing better. And I guess and I assume you wish we were doing better also. Yeah, I think it's important to recognize what has happened over the years in terms of progress. I think we all would want to have, uh, you know, a faster pace. Um, but, you know, we also have to keep in mind, you know, what it takes and the time to ensure that students can progress in the way that we like. And uh, I think that it says a lot about our educators and our teachers and what we've been able to accomplish, especially around literacy and the training and the, the deepening of our understanding around best practices and research and how students learn to read. Uh, and I believe that those early literacy efforts will continue to pay off and we'll see more gains as the areas um, improve for how students read and comprehend. So to the extent that we have multiple rounds, my intention is to have high level 10,000 feet and then maybe some specifics. So MacArthur High School, um, the the capital budget for MacArthur High School was reduced, I believe, in um, FY24, and then maybe money was moved in 
And I'm trying to understand what your plan is for what you're going to get done at MacArthur High School now. Is 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 the work that's going to happen between now and the opening essentially all funded in FY23? And where will that take us? And then what's your plan for the next tranche of investment at MacArthur High School? Well, so I'll have um, uh, Chief Ross come forward. He, he'll show a little bit more about uh, the details about what's in the capital budget for what we should expect. Uh, the goal was to ensure that we're able to start strong for our initial cohorts of the campus as we grow. Uh, this provides us an opportunity to expand some of the classroom space, hallway space, uh, because the campus was originally designed for middle school age students and younger right. students. And so we want to ensure that it can appropriately accommodate uh, our high school students. Uh, so we're confident that what is in the budget does reflect the appropriate space for uh, students that will be in transitioning there next year. And then we also wanted to have a space for food service as well, uh, up to the DCPS standard. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, council member and uh, chancellor. Uh, building on that answer, some of the money was shifted in uh, last year's capital budget, but the current budget for FY23 uh, is ongoing. We will be ready to deliver that product, you know, before school uh, school year starts. It is predominantly situated on right-sizing existing classrooms to account for the 200 students that we're going to be educating there next year, as well as building out the cafeteria. Then going forward, the additional influx of capital that Mayor Bowser has put into the budget is for an addition to the cap or to MacArthur High School, as well as right-sizing the additional classrooms that will not be touched in this current renovation. Oh, I see. So, so you just renovating some of the classrooms and hallways to, to uh, accommodate like a third of the eventual students and two thirds won't be updated at this point. And so then for that other work with the two thirds of the classrooms and hallways to be updated um, and then the addition, that will be around $78 million. Is that the idea? That's correct. Um, that work, once we end this renovation, uh, we'll move into next fiscal year where we'll begin the contract and procurement process to bring on an additional architect for that, that work. Oh, and that will start, that you'll, you'll begin the contract procurement process. And when, when would you hope that, that that other capacity would come on stream? That's a very good question. We would need to get a little closer to actual uh, loading of the funds and able to see what the marketplace comes back with and bids to be able to answer that with specificity. All right, thank you very much. 15 seconds over, which is not that bad. You get a gold star. Council Member Henderson, I believe, is next. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I changed location. Um, good afternoon, Chancellor Fairby. I wanted to start uh, by asking a little bit about at-risk funding. Um, it, the number in the budget book uh, indicates that there's about 81.5 million um, going uh, for at-risk funding. Does that sound right to you and your team? We're last name again, Councilman Henderson, because you gave the number in. Um, 81.5 million. That sounds right, yes. Okay. However, um, we only see 70.8 million of that showing up in the school line items, um, which is amounts to about 87% that's going to schools. My understanding <clears throat> is the law that requires 90% of at-risk funding to go to schools. Can you explain what's going on here? Well, so we, in the alignment with the law, have allocated 90% of the at-risk funding. And so uh, the remaining funds are spread through uh, central service supports. No, I hear you in terms of the law. What I'm telling you is that when you, um, divide out 78 million in terms of schools, it, it, it does not equal 90, it equals 87%. That's, there may be a discrepancy in the administrative holdouts. So I'll have uh, Deputy Chief uh, Winslow share a little bit more about how that occurs as relates to the holdouts. Okay. Good afternoon, council member. That's right, so we do pass through 90% of the allocation to schools. Principals then budget those. If they buy a position with it, 
some portion of that position, the administrative add-ons cost is housed centrally in the budget book administratively. Okay, I see, I understand, okay. Um, continuing sort of in the question of adverse funding, um, in FY22, now this is based on the data it has, it appears that our schools only spent about 7 million of at-risk funding despite being budgeted for 58.2 million. Do you guys know what happened with the rest of the funding there? Or is that a typo? <clears throat> I think we could check with our OCFO team on the accounting side of that as the books closed in 22 and to see how they assigned the resources specific to at-risk to the expenditures that were found. Okay. In terms of operating for FY24, um, the school security uh, budget line item, is that something that DCPS is paying for or is another agency have those dollars? Probably something that DCPS pays for. All right. And I just want to confirm that for school year 23-24, DCPS will continue to cover the security costs for out of school time. That is correct. Okay. DCPS so will continue to cover the costs in school year 23-24. All right. <clears throat> Let's go to capital for a little bit. Um, I'm uh, my understanding is that the box, the back, the required backup documentation uh, for the CIP is on its way. Um, but will it include the cost of maintenance and operations? That information has not been included in previous versions. I will have to get back to you that I know it's in IQ at this time, but I don't believe that's included. Okay, so it's in IQ. So when should we expect it? I don't have a date to share at this moment, but we're happy to follow up. Okay, um, maybe I should have asked the deputy mayor before he left on that front. Um, so the, the capital projects that were supposed to be ECE additions for Moton and Langdon were zeroed out. Um, what... I, I, I'm asking you this question, even though I know the answer, uh, for the benefit of the public who may not have read your pre-hearing responses. Well, yeah, thank you, Councilman Henderson, again for that question. I think it is important for the community to know that we have not changed the number of seats that we'll be providing to families as a part of our early child education programming. However, to best support our students and families, we believe that we should consolidate and have a larger number of seats at selected sites. Uh, and so that is our plan going forward, and that is reflected in our capital investments. Okay. Uh, hi, Jordan. Um, in terms of um, swing space, we noticed significant we noticed significant increases um, in centralized swing space for a total of one hundred and twelve point four million. Um, that's an increase up from eighty one. Um, what is the cause for this particular increase? You want to speak to that, Chief Ross? I do. Thank you for that question, Council Member. That uh, increase is for the build out of additional swing spaces in wards one, five, seven, and eight. And those were planned swing spaces that are now being uh, funded in this year's uh, CIP. Wait, did you say a planned swing space in ward five? Yes. Okay, is this a swing space option that could be used for Burroughs Elementary, which I think the original plan was that they would swing to Meyer Elementary? I do want. Thank you so much for that question. Uh, yes, I, it's certainly something that we could uh, consider as we move closer to Burroughs' modernization. Okay, this is like big news because I think for them, you know, the Meyer move um, was a lot and sorry, joined by a DCPS student here. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the proposed move to Meyer um, was something that the school community was deeply concerned about in terms of the distance. And I was prepared to come and ask you about um, if you guys had had any conversations at all with um, Howard School of Divinity about perhaps using some of the space on the campus there as a swing space option. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Council Member. We have not had that specific conversation, but we have had ongoing conversations with Burroughs and their PTO and uh, LSAT after their outreach uh, earlier this year. And we'll continue to do that as we get closer to their modernization. Okay. Um, in the capital budget, we still have money allocated for school name changes, and yet we don't have a process yet. 
uh, are we are we continuing forward with our plans here? Uh, I've been in conversation uh, um, in the past couple of weeks with uh, Chairman Mendelson about a potential path forward. Uh, I have shared with the chairman that it is is my viewpoint and that of the executive that uh, all of the namings should be uh, coordinated through the council as the council uh, ultimately has uh, decision making authority over the naming. Okay, um, does that include in terms of the schedule of who goes next? That is correct. Okay, so it, if I'm thinking, like, so for instance, the new high school in War 3 that Councilmember Freeman was talking about, everyone has been referring to it as MacArthur High School. Is that its intended permanent name? Uh, that is not in, its intended permanent name. Um, we, again, I have discussed with the chairman that, you know, we would need to know, uh, you know, a point in time, uh, if we we're going to make a change for this upcoming school year, I don't anticipate um, that that would happen, but uh, our recommendation is that if there is to be a change, it be done before May 1st, um, but the intent is not to keep the MacArthur name in perpetuity. Okay. Um, the budget includes nearly an increase of nearly $8.4 million in tech modernizations. Are we doing some planned system refreshes? We are. Uh, we're continuing to do refresh, as I mentioned earlier, as a part of our plan uh, we're continuing to uh, refresh our smart boards, and then we're also refreshing uh, devices as well. Okay. Um, can we talk a little bit about the investment in the life and safety line item? In FY23, um, you all only had 3.6 million budgeted, but in FY24, we have 11 million that's proposed. Um, what projects are we um, doing specifically with that funding? I speak to life safety. Yeah, thank you for that question, Council Member. Those are going to be things like access control, door locks, intrusion detection, uh, as well as you know fire alarms, things of that nature. Everything that falls into that life safety bucket. Okay. And did you already provide to the committee a full breakout of um, the small capital projects that are planned for uh, FY24? I don't believe that we've provided the spin plans, which I believe is what you're asking for. Yes, or, or even just. Uh, I don't know, Truesdale Elementary. Well, no, that's a bad example because they're getting a modernization. Uh, Barnard, no, that's also not a good one. Um, Powell is going to see some sort of, I don't know, roof. Well, I hope we don't have to replace Powell roof because that's also a recent modernization, but basically just a breakdown of what you guys are going to be doing with the small cap money. Yes, we can follow up with you and provide that information. Awesome, thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll give back my 13 seconds because it's not enough time. Thank you. And Mr. Ross, when you get us that information or maybe a chance to make sure it comes to the committee of the whole as well as to Councilmember Henderson. Yes. yes. Uh, next up is Councilmember Lewis George. Thank you, Chairman. Um, and, and good afternoon, Chancellor. Um, I want to start with um, digital equity. Um, the proposed budget includes 412,000 decrease for the DCPS Digital Equity Fund. Is DCPS um, internalizing these costs through the US, um, the UPS FF or funding sources? So we, we are absorbing this into our budget. Uh, currently, okay. there is a um, little over $27 million invested into um, technology device investments in fiscal year 24. Okay, great. Um, and I want to thank you all for uh, delivering the updated tech equity plan to the council earlier this week. Uh, we are reviewing it and was very happy and excited to uh, receive that. So thank you for that. Thank you, Council Member. I want to go to the small capital budgets. I know you had um, a, co a conversation with Council Member Henderson. Um, we would like a sort of full breakdown and spend plan um, of each small capital project within the DCPS capital budget. Um, I do have some questions, though, to see uh, some war for, war for specific acts that we included in our budget letter. Does the small uh, cap budget include the roof repair um, to, uh, but does the budget include roof repair to fix McFarland's leaky media center roof? Uh, they've had to set out a trash can for two years now to catch falling water. 
So again, we will follow up on the small capital. I don't know that we could speak to each specific project today, but we certainly recognize that schools should have uh, the appropriate learning environment. And what you describe is, is not our standard and we'll ensure that that issue is addressed. Okay. Um, I know we sent these a couple of days ago, but I'm going to put these on the record so that we can get an actual reply for the ones that are war for one specific, um, because I need to make these sure these are addressed before uh, the, this budget is passed. Um, so uh, in the life and safety budget, I want to make sure that includes a new front door buzzer at Brightwood Elementary. Um, and in the major repairs budget, I want to make sure that includes a fix for the bathroom at the Coolidge High School track. Uh, and uh, in the HVAC replacements budget, I want to make sure that includes a new HVAC system for Whittier. Um, in the athletic facilities budget, I want to make sure that fixes Powell's playground erosion issues. Uh, and I want to make sure in the athletic, athletic field and park budget, which uh, in, should include funding to replace the field and track uh, at Lafayette. Um, so when you get that itemized uh, specific cap budget there, I just want to make sure the ones that the war for issues, I can know whether those are addressed. Um, I know you said uh, you were building additional spring space, uh, swing space in Ward 1, Ward 5, 7, and 8. Uh, I wanted to know why can't we provide a modular space for Whittier ahead of their modernization? Uh, their building is in terrible shape and we can't expect them to continue on like this for another two years. Yeah, uh, we are uh, continue to evaluate uh, swing space options and work for, you know, uh, we were able to right. be creative to, uh, to create the space for Dorothy Height and right. uh, the accompanying modernizations. Yeah. And so um, we'll continue to explore every option uh, to ensure that we are able to address the needs of Whittier. I do know that it's important to know that we are in the uh, pre-design process uh, as part of the fiscal 24 budget. Uh, and then we will continue in out years in preparation to support the facility needs at Whittier. Okay. Um, yeah, that's something we want to look to because right now, you know, even though we work with DGS in this space, there's a number of issues at Whittier that seem like, uh, you know, two years uh, working and learning in those conditions um, even even as we look at other issues around like air quality, et cetera. Um, so uh, as we look to that, I, I am advocating for a modular space for Woody ahead of their modernization so they don't have to be in those conditions. Um, I want to ask, does this does it have do you have additional money for the renovation of Garnett Patterson? Um, we heard testimony yesterday in my committee from staff at Roosevelt Stay who said they don't have a science lab a child development center or other basic amenities and we need to support them. Um, do, do you know if there's additional uh, funding for uh, Garnett Patterson? There is. Um, there's additional funding for uh, elevator in fiscal year 24 and then also the science lab ventilation in fiscal year 23. But I also think it's important to note uh, when the decision was made to transition uh, from Roosevelt, um, right. we, were, we were very clear that, um, you know, the facility planning was not, um, you know, a part of that process and it will take some time. Um, we do, though, believe that um, the feasibility is not there for a child development center. Um, we believe that there are appropriate providers uh, in the vicinity of the school that can provide services uh, okay. to families and students. Okay. Yeah, and and I remember that, and I understand. I understood that in the outset, and I, and I really do appreciate your work on 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 that piece. Um, uh, and it's important that we do work with the students who have childcare needs to get yeah, childcare. That's right. Okay, that that's what I wanted to hear in, in that regard. Um, and just to confirm, the science the science lab for Garnett Patterson is that in fiscal year twenty three. That is in twenty three. Correct. Okay. Um, we've talked about life and safety a lot. Um, I know you discussed some of this with Councilman Henderson, but I want to clarify this issue. Does the DCPS small capital budget pro uh, project uh, for life safety include funding to ensure all our schools, locks and doors are functioning properly? So it does include um, funding of approximately $5 million for locks and access, and then we'll continue to evaluate and assess um, repairs that are needed or adjustments needed to ensure that they're functional. 
Uh, also knowing that there may be any new work orders that may be uh, needed to be responded to as relates to lock and safety. But we do continue to prioritize safety as a part of our efforts to ensure that our buildings are secure for staff and students. Okay, I appreciate that we have the $5 million there. I guess um, one question I have is right now, is there a process for DCPS and DGS to check and make sure all our doors and locks work properly? Or are we sort of a res just a uh, responsive system where we are just we're just waiting on work order requests to identify the issues? I'm just concerned that we're not proactively check checking that our schools are safe. We do assess um, our locking features. Uh, it is something that even I, my school visits, uh, do a check for, and then we rely on uh, work orders and um, our comprehensive assessments that we do periodically to ensure that. Uh, locking systems work. However, um, just take a moment that we do remind schools, I remind schools that it's important to keep the facilities secure because oftentimes when people do That's enter right. a building, uh, it's through a prop door or uh, some other means. And so we want to also assure, and as we work on locks, that other procedures are also uh, followed and people are vigilant with keeping our buildings secure. Okay. Um, I, I agree with you. And that's why I was wondering, I'm just trying to get a sense of, does DCPS uh, central office check that doors lock every year? Sort of like, is there like a proactive system that you all sort of do every year, like a proactive risk assessment, uh, risk assessment and safety check of our schools? Yes, there's annual uh, risk planning each year. Uh, and each okay. school also asked to produce a safety plan as well. And then we also regular check our buildings to ensure that they're secure. Okay, um, that's something you know you, we've discussed, and you've you've noted is of the utmost importance. So we'll continue to work together with you and DGS around our life and safety, and making sure our schools are secure, um, and safe, especially in this current um, I don't know political moment or you know yeah. that's it's right. important to know. You called out the um, Department of General Services. We're grateful because they're also a part of that that's assessment right. and walkthroughs that we do at that's the building. Right. Um, I want to ask about the enrollment reserve. Thank you for answering my question about the enrollment reserve and follow up to the performance oversight hearing last month. The approved budget for the enrollment reserve in fiscal year 23 was just over 1 million. Uh, DCPS says they spent almost 3.9 million so far this year in compensating schools for enrollments over their projected amounts. Where did the additional almost 3 million in funding come from? And will these figures show up as reprogrammings within fiscal year 23? Can you give me that question one more time? Make sure. So you you're referencing the en enrollment, enrollment reserve. reserve, right? So DCBS says they spent almost three point nine million so far this year in compensating for enrollments over their projected amounts. And so, where did the additional almost three million funding come from? And will these figures, more importantly, show up as reprogrammings within fiscal year twenty three? Got you. Got you. Yeah. So there were some reprogramming that needed to take place because. Um, many of the uh, issues were raised well into the school year. That's right. We, we utilize um, our ESSER resources to support schools as well, but I'll, I'll turn to Deputy Chief Winslow. He can speak a little bit more about the enrollment reserves. Yeah, thank you, Chancellor. Uh, so this was financed prim primarily, the overage was financed primarily through working with our OCFO and identifying vacancy savings. And as they execute the PS budget, they'll reconcile each of those pieces, including reprogramming out of the existing enrollment reserve. Okay, and when did schools get access to this additional funding? Council member, sorry to cut you off. Okay, sorry. Your time is up. Council, you, there'll be another round or two. Council member Parker. Good to see you again, Chancellor. Good afternoon. I'm going to start uh, with some of the line items in the proposed 24 budget. So for the Office of Teaching and Learning, I'm seeing uh, an eight, $0.1 million increase. Can you just specify what justifies this increase and what should we expect to come from that? Well, in this upcoming school year, we are replicating much of the work that we've done with uh, literacy and math. Uh, so we're making significant investment in what we call the science and math. And there's um, some investments for professional learning. Uh, we're buying new instructional materials as well. Uh, and so we wanted to ensure that we have the same uh, benefits and outcomes associated with what we've done in literacy and math, uh, because we continue to see some struggles in math performance in comparison to reading. 
Okay. Uh, one, I've never heard of the science of math, so I have to, that's, that's, I have to look into that. But, but um, you know, and some others' views as relates to just connecting brain research and what we know about how the brain processes material and content and applying some of those principles to, to math as we've done in literacy. And how many FTs are associated with that increase? Uh, I would say the majority of that would be um, professional learning, curriculum resources. Uh, I don't anticipate any increases in, in FTEs. Okay. Um, there was an enough. As you know, yep. what we did add, we did add some additional resources this school year, the current school year we're in, and what we call uh, our math squads. And these are a team of um, coaches that go to schools uh, for periods of time to support them in their math instruction. But but that wouldn't be a new resource in fiscal year 24. Got it. Um, in an oversight hearing, we talked about the uh, dyslexia legislation, or at least that's what I call it, uh, where uh, the LEA is supposed to screen, monitor, and support uh, students. Uh, there was discussion around hiring more capacity in schools. Where is that represented in the budget? I believe you're referring to um, our letters training. Uh, and that training is is still ongoing. Uh, I don't anticipate so the law dictates that schools are supposed to screen and diagnose students. One of the questions I posed in the oversight hearing is, are we adding yet one more thing onto teachers' plates? Your response is, no, we're going to hire additional staff to support with the screening and monitoring right. of students. Um, around dyslexia, but also other reading disabilities. And I just want to know where that is represented in the budget. Well, that must have been uh, a misunderstanding because we are providing additional opportunities for teachers to get trained, but we have the staff to implement the screening. So I don't anticipate- And who is doing the screening? Are those like classroom teachers are, that are expected to do that? Uh, it could be. Uh, it could be some of our, our reading cultures. It could be members of our um, plus the support model. Uh, and so we typically screen students in small groups. And again, like I said earlier, I have the appropriate staff to do so. Okay. Um, I want you to know when you all follow up with stuff from oversight hearings, we do read it. So thank you for the follow up. Uh, I did want to come to the enrollment reserve numbers that you provided. Before I dig into specifics, are these numbers supposed to be interpreted as salaries, 100% salaries that go to the teachers that you're saying were hired, or are there other figures incorporated here? Most of the enrollment reserve uh, does go to cover the cost of, of teachers' salaries and benefits. Because I'm looking at Coolidge High School, for instance, and you're saying you had to tap the re enrollment reserve for $433,000 for a custodian, a guidance counselor, and a SPED teacher, and that seems really high. Well, that would include the salary and benefits uh, know, associated with $433,000 for a custodial worker, guidance counselor, and a SPED teacher? Yeah, so it would depend on, you know, where they are. Um, again, our our salary schedules can produce um, base salaries of 140000 147000 uh, And again, that would also need to be benefits added on to that. So as to well. make sure I'm clear. So when I read these numbers, that is 100% salary and benefit. The majority of our enrollment reserve goes towards salary and benefits. So we're, 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 no, I'm talking about the numbers in this chart. So when I look at the number $433,000, is that 100% salary and benefit or is there some other figure that's tucked in there? That'd be all salary and benefit. Okay, thank you. Um, there are a number of Ward 5 schools that were on the list, Langdon, Langley, Wheatley, that received funds. And I'm just comparing that with some of the proposed budgets, and it's not necessarily aligning. So for instance, Wheatley, you're saying you tapped the enrollment reserve for $144,000 for an ELL teacher and an aide, which makes sense given the migrant students who are housed at the day's end, many of whom are going to Wheatley. Totally makes sense. When I look at the projected enroll uh, or the budget for Wheatley, uh, it seems as though their budget is essentially flat from last year, a difference of about $100,000. It doesn't seem to incorporate 
the fact that you had to tap the enrollment reserve. If I look at, for instance, Langdon Elementary School, you're saying you invested $361,000 for two ELL teachers, makes sense. Migrant students are going there as well. And then I look at the numbers from Langdon and I'm just not seeing how we're saying we have to spend these monies mid-year, but the budget doesn't reflect the increase, even that increase from last year's proposed budget. Yeah, so all of our migrant uh, supports are considered in our language acquisitions uh, projections and allocation, and that's how we allocate staff to schools. Um, but we always, as we did this year, as you pointed out in the enrollment reserve, uh, provide additional staffing as needed. Uh, and I think if you look specifically at Wheatley, they've increased in their uh, EL staff by five FTEs. Uh, and so um, there may be um, situations where there are central based staff as well, also supporting language learners in these schools that you're referencing. I get that. Um, I'm not, not to belabor the point. So Langdon, you're saying you gave them an additional $361,000 because their budget wasn't enough. Yet the increase in their fiscal year 24 budget is not $361,000 more. I would expect there, even if you were gonna keep it flat, to incorporate that increase. And so I would just love some a better understanding, perhaps at a follow-up of around how do you go from the enrollment reserve figures to the proposed 24 budget? Um, because it just isn't aligning or making sense to me. Yeah, I think the, the budget assistance that provided were designed to provide unique immediate need at a point in time that I don't know that's always transferable to the upcoming school year. Uh, and so we'll be happy to spend some more time going okay. through what their, you know, projected enrollment is for the coming school year and the needs of their language. And shout population. out to your team because they did follow up and it's not uh, even uh, not feeling well, uh, did a good job of just talking through some things. So I wanted to uh, shout you. them out for that. Um, in my remaining two minutes, Burroughs and Langley, I requested of the mayor uh, to accelerate their modernization. That did not happen. We know that they are on schedule uh, for modernization. Um, can you just speak to where in the budget are you, uh, and I guess that may be under G DGS, but how are you thinking about meeting school upkeep and maintenance over the course of the year so we don't see the disruptions that we saw this year, namely at Burroughs and Langley, but in many other schools? Yeah, so we continue to collaborate with DGS on all of the work orders uh, and ensuring that we're also responsive in preventive maintenance. There is um, line items in DGS budget that includes uh, resources for both. Uh, and so we have had uh, some success uh, recently with addressing the HVAC situation. Uh, we don't anticipate that being uh, an ongoing issue going forward, um, but those will be issues that we'll continue to monitor. Uh, as we work towards their modernization. And I know there, is, there was a lot of back and forth around Anacostia. I just wanna echo some of those concerns. McKinley Middle School is another example of a school that is trying, folk are trying to turn around, but year after year we're seeing budget cuts there where they don't have the resources, the energy, the investment to actually attract families and turn around. In my last 20 seconds, um, in your follow-up, and I'm gonna end, uh, you talked about the revisions to the impact of teacher evaluation system. One of the things I don't see here is around professional development. And I actually think that's one of the biggest pieces that's missing. Can you speak to once a teacher is evaluated, and I'm actually not going to ask, I'll catch this next time, but around how we're addressing teacher development after a teacher is actually evaluated. But hold that until the next round. Hold that until the next round. Councilmember Pinto. Thank you, Chairman. Hi, Chancellor Farabee. Hello, Customer Pinto. Good evening. Um, I would like to start with some Ward 2 school issues. Um, so the first is around Thomas Hallway lighting. Uh, Tom Thompson Elementary School has uh, some hallways with dimmed lighting. I've seen this myself in various hallways. Is this something that can be absorbed by your current budget um, to make sure that lighting and all the hallways can be maintained, which of course present safety concerns or are there other funding barriers that we need to address? 
Uh, we would need to evaluate um, the lighting issue that you referenced uh, with um, Department of General Services uh, to see what type of response can be made. Of course, we would want to ensure that there's appropriate mm -hmm. lighting. I'm assuming that you're referring to interior lighting. That's right. These are interior lights just in the um, public hallways inside the school. Yes, we're happy to evaluate that to see what uh, can be done. Um, sometimes um, could be bulb replacement um, or uh, some type of LED enhancement that can be made to potentially improve the lighting. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate your attention to it. It has been over two years since we've been trying to get these lights resolved. Um, so I appreciate that. Uh, similar lighting question, but on the exterior for Garrison Elementary School. Will this proposed budget allow for any installation of lighting at Garrison's Field? As you may know, Garrison's Field is used uh, not only by the Garrison school community, but also by the public on nights and weekends. I don't recall Garrison exterior lighting being a part specifically identifying the budget, but I want to confirm with Chief Roth is there any additional context he may have. That is correct, uh, uh, Chancellor. Currently, it's not in this year's budget, but it is something that we could work with our DGS partners to see if there are options as we move forward into the next fiscal year. Okay, thank you. Um, for Hardy Middle School, I was really uh, excited to see that the cafeteria and kitchen renovations are being prioritized uh, to ensure that we can accommodate the student enrollment increases that we're seeing there and create a more efficient food service program and create for more efficient space. But one of the other major concerns I've he heard from Hardy students and parents is around uh, the locker sizes. And apparently the lockers are so narrow that students are unable to put their backpacks inside. And so students are kind of just lining the hallways with their backpacks. I assume that this is a cost and kind of the general order of things with DCPS that could be absorbed throughout the year's budget, but I just want to confirm. Yeah, I would want to know a little bit more. I have not observed that at Hardy Middle School in my visits there, uh, but there could be ways that we could address that um, without adjusting the physical structure of the lockers, but we'll work with the administration there to determine you know, how lockers are being used, whether it's being used by one student, or lockers are being shared, uh, what's creating the cramped space for locker time and see if there's other options or alternatives that we could create. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, for teacher parking, this is an issue that I hear from teachers really in all of our school communities about access to parking and trying to find parking unsuccessfully or having to pay for parking. How does this budget seek to meet teacher parking and transit needs? at our DCPS and DCPCS schools? Yeah, we are continuing to, to collaborate with uh, city leaders to ensure that there are options for teachers for parking when available and when feasible. Uh, so we've been fortunately to able to create a, a program with the Department of Transportation, uh, the teacher parking program, which allows teachers to have some of the benefits of parking uh, as residents for uh, a minimal fee. And uh, in some places, there's more space than others, but we'll continue to work with DDOT to ensure that if there is space, that this teacher parking program can be applied to nearby locations around schools that have limited parking. Okay, great. And is there, is the budget sufficient to expand it if the circumstances allow? We anticipate that we're able to continue. Uh, I think the primary barrier will be just availability of spaces. Uh, so I don't foresee it as a financial issue, but more so just um, space for people to park. Okay. Um, I look forward to working with you on that because it's something that comes up every year uh, from our teachers and want to make sure we're supporting their ability to, to get to school. Um, school psychologists, the budget currently provides for one psychologist per school. It's my understanding that only 64% of schools actually have a school psychologist. Do you anticipate that you'll be able to actually hire and place a psychologist in every school next year? 
I think that's an area where um, we're still challenged. Uh, we're challenged by a national uh, shortage of um, licensed school psychologists. Uh, we have had a number of, of planning and, and, and thought partnering with school leaders and others around what we might do to be responsive to fill this, this need. And I think we are going to you know, evaluate the current structure we have uh, in terms of how we allocate the positions and also I think the way the role is utilized in schools. I think one of the challenges we're having nationally is that if you have those credentials, um, there's other jobs and roles that you can pursue that may be a little bit more flexible. And so I think, you know, flexible options for scheduling and how they provide those supports would be something that we could um, potentially explore as well. So um, we're excited that this is a part of our hard to fill area as a part of our recent collective bargain agreement with the Washington Teacher Union. So we're able to provide additional compensation, but we're still also looking at options for, you know, how we may restructure the position or allocation of the position. Okay. Uh, the restorative justice coordinators are flexible positions at each of our schools. Do you track outcomes or other data to analyze the impact of restorative justice coordinators at our schools as we're trying to figure out what's effective and what needs continued support? We, we evaluate um, the instructional program at a school and you know, their academic or mental health outcomes. Um, we take a comprehensive look. Uh, and so for example, uh, we do look at out of school suspensions and other disciplinary infractions as a measure, uh, but we know that this is one of many uh, strategies uh, to address this area. So. Um, we, we try not to isolate specifically the position, but we do look at the overall outcomes and, and what strategies the schools are applying to be responsive. And why do you not isolate the specific positions? Uh, because I, I think, you know, when we think about, you know, the restorative work happening in the schools, I don't think that it falls squarely on the shoulders of one person. We just see this as a collective responsibility of the school environment. Um, with the support of these individuals. Got it. Okay. And one of the pieces of feedback that I've gotten from folks who do this work in our schools or other violence intervention efforts in the community is that instead of applying kind of numeric data to determine efficacy, it may be more useful to use qualitative data to understand examples of people who were helped and strategies that were employed um, as we're doing that type of evaluation. And I thought that's been interesting feedback and helpful feedback. Yeah, for me, one thing that I've done is been helpful is just the ability to observe and be a part of those restorative strategies and circles and, and structures. So um, that's something we'll continue to utilize. And we're also working uh, to develop a rubric uh, to look at school-wide implementation of restorative practices as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then lastly, very important to me is um, making sure that our schools can open to the public um, in circumstances like on evenings and weekends. And we have a number of schools that do this by choice, um, and we're very grateful for that. But there are certain limited incidents of vandalism or other crime or um, activity going on in these spaces, and we need to be providing security so that those schools don't have to pick up the mess, literally and figuratively, when, when issues happen. So what is DCPS's policy for providing security services when a school is open on nights and weekends? And is there any funding allocated in this budget to provide campus security and custodial support uh, for rec activities essentially going on on nights and weekends in the community, but for our schools? Um, we support schools uh, as long as they submit the appropriate requests uh, to support uh, with custodial or other operational needs as a result of facility use. Um, our security team also works closely with DGS when there is uh, facility use and there's a need to have security present as well. Okay, well, that's news to me. That's very exciting. We will uh, work with the particular schools that are having the most issues around that um, on submitting those requests because I'd love to see some more consistent uh, custodial support and security 
for those schools. As I said, we want to make sure that opening the school community up to the public is supported and that we don't have other principals looking at it and, and saying that's not going to work for us. Uh, but thank you so much, Chancellor. Thank you, Chairman. Thank, thank you, you Councilmember. Let's do another round. Uh, Chancellor, I believe I'm next. Um, the, um, I think I've asked this question of you at previous hearings. As you know, DCPS as an LEA has received a 5.05% increase in its UPSFF funding, which is your principal funding. Uh, but the increase is not going to fund the WTU collective bargaining agreement. The collective bargaining agreement is being funded through funds in the workforce investment fund, which is outside of the formula. So where did the 5% increase Go. So our budget, and I want to be clear with the point you raised about the, the, the contract is that um, typically over time, uh, it does get baked into the DCPS budget. Uh, and I think here in this unique circumstance, uh, this recent contract was primarily uh, a retroactive contract, which required um, a different solution. Uh, and our budget is a part of the increase. Uh, of course, there are inflationary costs associated with operations. And also, uh, we bake into a, a increase of, of other costs for personnel and non-personnel. And then we also increase the allocation uh, to schools as well, and also any other central services need uh, that support schools as well. So it just got distributed among all of DCPS's accounts, other than, of course, the WTU, WTU personnel. We start with our school allocations first, uh, and then yeah, but they, we... your testimony was a budget schools got stabilized at ninety five percent. So that's not a five percent increase. Well, with your statement, I can read it to you. You said that the schools' budgets were stabilized at ninety five percent. That is correct. Okay, so where did the 5% go to the, uh, I mean, two thirds, three fourths of your personnel are teachers. So uh, it couldn't have gone to 5%. This is 5% on your $1.2 billion budget. Yeah, but there were also increases in school budgets as well. And so enrollment grew. Uh, and then we provided an additional $11 million in funding. Uh, for our concentration weight, uh, which is in addition to what's in the uniform per student funding formula. And so not, not all schools were held to 95%. I would say that is more so uh, a sure. minimum and yeah. not a max. Yeah, but it's pretty clear that schools didn't go up 5%. A few might have, most didn't. Uh, so it's still not clear to me where the five percent UPSFF. Yeah. Well, there, there was. I mean, I gave example in my testimony. Coolidge, you know, Woodson was another. But there, especially at a high school level, uh, where we saw uh, significant increases in enrollment and also uh, need, the dollars followed the students in the schools accordingly. You're reminding me of the last round where I asked about Ron Brown went down 770,000, Anna Costa went down 899,000. Let me try a different question. Uh, what is the status of the contract negotiations? With which bargaining unit? Washington Teachers Union. Uh, so the Washington Teachers Union uh, recently provided some um, preliminary um, expectations around uh, what they wanted to accomplish with the agreement. Um, that is under review, uh, but we have not entered in uh, formal negotiations of yet. Uh, we're still in the process of, of closing out a number of other uh, negotiations that we're in with the goal to ensure that we close the year with uh, everyone being on a contract. Uh, and we still are having active and ongoing conversations with the WTU about a new contract for them as well. Uh, but the negotiations haven't opened. Official negotiations have not opened. Okay. So when will they open? I don't have a date yet. Well, uh, are we going to go to next year? Yeah, next school year? 
or calendar year or whatever next year means? Yeah, um, I don't know. I think it's in, you know premature to set a timeline at this point. Uh, again, having we just received recent information about you know what their expectations are. I think this contract negotiation process will look different uh, than the previous one, uh, given where we are. But I do, and I believe that the Washington Teachers Union as well have an interest in uh, doing a deeper dive in, in some of the non-compensation items that we have interest in in addressing. All right. Well, these are the facts. The last contract was negotiated what three years after it was had the previous one had expired. Well, the current contract was negotiated roughly three years after the last one was had expired. That's fact one. Fact two is that I think it was very damaging to the budget process uh, for us to go so long. I think that's clear today. Yeah. And so I'm not interested in seeing the next contract because the current contract expires in six months. Yeah, I don't, I don't have that same uh, desire either. I think it's in our best interest. So um, we have the also under the law. So I think there's an important fact to consider is that in the midst of the last negotiation process, we had two lengthy negotiations around our pandemic response. Well, I, I don't, I don't care. I know you don't care, but I think it's an important fact, though. Well, I, you have the ability under the law to open the negotiations at any time. I believe the law says that negotiations should, maybe even says, shall be, be commence. It's a certain date before I believe the contract expires. So you have that ability. You have the ability to open the negotiations. You don't have to wait for the union. So it's as much on you as it is on the union. And I don't want to have this conversation with you in the fall. Understood. Um, but again, I do want to point out again, the public health emergency. We prioritize how we best get our students and staff and back in schools. Well, let me go to a different issue. Um, the, uh, um, how much is the school security contract? Chief first, you want to speak to the security contract numbers? Mr. Chairman, uh, in the current fiscal year, it's approximately 23 million, and next year we're projecting approximately 27 million. And um, that would show up in line, I think it's uh, line 41, and that's controller source group number. Yes, I believe that's correct. Yeah, which has uh, 57 million budgeted for next year. That's for all contracts. That is correct. Um, so why is it that that line controller source group line 41 has increased from 40 million this year to 57 million next year? That is almost a 50% increase. See, half of 40 million would be 20, that would be 60, that's going to be 57. Why is, why is it going up so much? Uh, we're shifting from ESSER uh, onto local funds. So uh, the security contract's going up 4 million, but generally the increase isn't due to contracts going up. That is correct. Um, there are contract rates that do increase. That's why you're seeing the difference from last year to the next year of 23 to 27. Uh, but it's not as uh, gargantuan as that line item would make you believe. But would ESSER have been budgeted in line 41? Previously, I believe that it would, yes. Oh, excuse me, no, that's on Aussie's budget. That's on Aussie's budget. That's correct. Okay. Uh, why not use ESSER money this year? Because some is available for uh, the security contract. I believe that's a part of the intentional step down of SR resources that we're utilizing to ensure that we don't create um, significant fiscal cliffs in fiscal year 25. So we're in a part of an intentional ramp down, as I mentioned earlier, was similar to what we've done with how we allocated one-time resources to schools. 
So that's the entirety of the answer is to have the fiscal cliff this year, not next year. Well, we are losing on extra resources in fiscal year 24, um, but we're strategically applying them in fiscal year uh, 24 to ensure that we have a, a process to manage the cliff in 25. I'm over my time. Uh, council member, there's an echo here. Is council member Robert White still here? I don't see him. Council member Fuller. Thank you very much. Um, so let's talk about a fiscal cliff. It, it's going to be less of a question as just a statement. I mean, I think that what we're seeing happening is one cliff in 24 for schools that had gotten one-time money, and then a second cliff that you anticipate in FY25. And I have to say advocates in the school communities that I'm closest to had said they thought that, that, that we'd go over those cliffs maybe maybe all at once or over time and how devastating it would be to staffing inside of schools uh, in many places including in in ward three we're not going to come to an agreement on this today but just putting a marker down that i very much think that the idea of going over these cliffs is a mistake that we shouldn't be withdrawing as much resources from schools as we are. And we can go through it case by case at different time, um, but it's from my perspective, a real problem. And, we're, and what's driving it is that we have a formula. You guys have come up with a new formula and I'm, a, I'm very skeptical of formulas. I think formulas almost always fail in some places and that you have to have flexibility around it. Um, there, there's a school in Ward 3, Merch Elementary School, that has uh, in 27, 28 kids in a class in kindergarten and first grade, and they really need two more teachers. If they had two more teachers, then they could have appropriate sized class sizes in those grades. And it is part of the WTU contract to have class sizes of 20 in, the, in those grades. How do those class size calculations fit into the formula that you guys developed? And maybe that's a question for you, maybe it's a question for Kevin, but how, how does that get accounted for? Uh, so class size is a, a, a consideration uh, in terms of how we allocate resources. Uh, however, we know that class size is fluid. Uh, it does change throughout the school year uh, based on students who may enroll uh, and, and students may leave the school, which is why we set aside the enrollment reserves. And so that's one of the primary tools we utilize to address any changes in enrollment and class size throughout the school year. Uh, we did hear the testimony from the community from Merch, uh, and we have committed to um, looking at their staffing levels to determine if there's any adjustments we need to make for this school year. Uh, and we'll continue to monitor their enrollment for next school year as well. Well, I, I'm, I'm very glad to hear that because, you know, I raised class sizes is one of the one of the metrics and another is mid-year arrivals, which creates a particular challenge. And the phenomenon of mid-year arrivals is, is very heavily uh, east of the river uh, phenomenon. It's not a phenomenon in Ward 3 in anything like the same way, except at Merge. Merch had 31 new students in the course of the year last year, and I think there's every reason to think that they will have more students coming in the middle of next year also. And so if you have resources that you can put them on a footing where they have appropriate class sizes in kindergarten and first grade next year, um, I would really urge you to, to do that and, and to let me know if you've done it because uh, it's a high priority for me to, to get that done. Uh, turning to a different topic, um, the last time I looked, it was about 
20, 25 schools that had gotten phase one modernizations, but not had complete modernizations. That's a couple of years ago, and there's been more that's been happening in the in the CIP since. How many schools do we have out there in your portfolio that have yet to receive a full modernization and aren't yet in the queue for this year's capital improvement plan? Do you have a sense of that? We do have a sense of that, but I would have to follow up with specifics. Um, yeah, I think it's, and this is another one where uh, essentially all of the schools in Ward 3 have gotten full modernization. So this is an Ward 3 issue, but I do worry about places that have not, and, and often those schools are located in in some of our lower income communities. And it's really important if we're trying to build enrollment and build the attractiveness of the system that we deliver really great modernizations to those schools, even if today they appear to have low enrollment because a, a great renovation can actually be a tool to attracting students. So please do get back to me on that. And, and please note I'm advocating not on behalf of Ward 3 with that one, but but on behalf of the city as a whole. A uh, council member on my team was able to pull that. It's 11 schools at this time. So the light at the end of the tunnel is bright. Let's, let's, get, it, let's get it done as soon as we can. Uh, there was a reference earlier to the Episcopal School and as a tool for alleviating overcrowding at Lafayette Elementary. And Lafayette Elementary, the, I mean, the numbers are our eye popping how many kids we have there. And there was, a, I think Deputy Mayor Kine suggested that you may be in conversations with them. Is there a conversation going on around that subject now? There, there has been, um, there hasn't been uh, active conversation recently. Um, the Episcopal Church has been in conversations with finalizing um, their deal with Murray. And I think they've asked us to to hold as they finalize that. And so um, once they're done, we look forward to coming back to the table to see what options exist for DTPS to expand our footprint. Well, well that's heartening to hear as well, because I think that that could be a great opportunity in that in that neighborhood generally to take some pressure off of Lafayette. And, and I will say, you know, it's, this isn't you, but we now have these community-based organizations that are doing pre-K and early childhood. And those are working to take some pressure off of the, the crowding and the lack of access to pre-K three and pre-K four and Ward three. I worry a little about that because in order to be sure to get a seat in one of those places, you have to pay for the early years and then you're guaranteed a seat in, for pre-K three and pre-K four. And I don't want to create a two-tiered thing where people who can afford it get pre-K three and pre-K four, and people who can't lose out and can lose out in a lottery. So I hope we can keep an eye on that together. Yeah, and we also encourage um, Lafayette families to continue to take advantage of Military Road. You know, we recently opened that site, and uh, we know that some of the families have have decided to to use that as an option, and so we'll continue to highlight that as well. Yeah, and solving the pre-K issues in Ward 3 is going to be a challenge because the schools are overfull without having the pre-K. And there's, you know, there's only so much capacity you can add on some of these sites. And so we, we need creative alternative solutions. Let's, let's have them, but let's make sure they're equitable. And, and we continue to keep our eyes to the ground on you know, facilities that may come available. I mean, that's how we were able to secure some of the facilities recently that we acquired, military role included. And so um, as, as facility becomes available, we'll, we'll see if the feasibility to, to act on them. Well, I'll offer you a little bit of pretty one. How about Whittle? We, we have explored the Whittle option. And, and I hope that I hope we can continue the conversation about that as well. Uh, to bring it back, Stoddard Elementary, and we've had conversations about this, and I've talked about this with your team. The whole plan for Stoddard Elementary has been enmeshed with thinking about Fox Hall over time, and I believe that there was an idea 
don't make Foxhall, don't make Stoddard too big because some of those kids should feed over to Foxhall. And some of the ideas around that, I think were very, very wrong headed, but, I, but in any case, I think that was part of the context in thinking about Stoddard. Well, now Foxhall has been put off for a very long time. And I hope that your team will step back and revisit what's the appropriate size for the Stoddard edition because I think that what we're, we're on a path to build an addition that's too small on day one. And I think we, I think you measure twice, cut once. And I hope that your team will step back with me in consultation and think about how we get Stoddard right instead of proceeding and building it too small and being boxed in. There's some talk about adding a third floor and I'm all for adding a third floor, but I very much worry about the interplay with the Commission on Fine Arts and Historic Preservation, that you could, in theory, add a, add a third floor, but in practice, you might not be able to get it done. So let's get this right up, up front and let's, let's engage on that, I hope, in the coming weeks. Yeah, we'll continue to engage. I think the good news is there is funding in the, the CIP for started to, to get permanent space, which would um, put them at capacity, I think about 95% uh, of utilization, and um, we'll continue to, you know, evaluate the Fox House situation as, as we have boundary decisions made and also look at future projections for growth. Well, I don't over time, but I want, to, I want to now, before we start shovels hitting dirt, engage around thinking around stock. Okay, we'll continue to engage. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you. Council Member Parker. I want to come back to the building maintenance and repair. Can you just talk me through, like, what is DCPS doing to both take an inventory of school maintenance needs and utilizing um, capital dollars and working alongside DGS to get those things addressed in the short term? Yeah, so in recent years, we've had a focus on fire life safety, which is reflected in our budget. And, and so we continue to um, prioritize those projects as, as dollars become available in our budget. Uh, secondly, has been HVAC, which we've had significant investment in our HVAC system. And then the third area has been preventive maintenance. We believe that we can get in front of some of the facility uh, issues that we've seen and and ensuring that we have a regular maintenance schedule to ensure that we're uh, strong on the front end and preventing uh, the need to, to provide service. Uh, our small capital projects, is important to note, has been informed by, you know, chronic repairs that we often make. And so um, if we're having issue with a boiler and it's a repeated issue with a boiler, we prioritize that to ensure that there's a more of a permanent fix so that we don't continue to try to make uh, smaller repairs that aren't effective. Uh, and then uh, we also have looked closely carefully at playgrounds, roofs uh, as an area of, of prioritization. Of course, we also rely on work orders as well. Uh, and we continue to, to provide an opportunity for principals to give us feedback. And so Department of General Services and DCPS uh, has recently established a structure where there's regular uh, opportunities to bring principals in and give us direct feedback on uh, the facility issues that they're seeing in their building and how we might be responsive to those repairs needed. I appreciate that. It just continued, continues to amaze me that we have spent so much money on buildings that are in disrepair. We're putting a lot of money into school budgets and students can't utilize certain classrooms. I was just at McKinley and the the, the ceiling is falling apart because of leaking roofs. At Langdon, parents are complaining about the cafeteria and bathrooms. I just got an email from the Ward 8 State Board member talking about the doors at Ketchum. Like this is a citywide pervasive issue about the maintenance and upkeep of our buildings. And I get HVAC and I get why all of those other things are important, but there seems to be like low hanging fruit opportunities for us to address the upkeep of our upkeep of our buildings that it's just not clear that we're taking advantage of. So um, I will follow up and work with your team, but I just, at least in Ward 5 especially, would love to just do and make an inventory of what are all of the outstanding asks 
And how can we take action on the, the small things that can make a big difference, like lighting in a classroom, the lighting in the auditorium at McKinley. And, and I almost hate saying these things because it kind of uh, casts a bad light on some of our schools, which are doing amazing work, but they don't always have the buildings up to speed to meet them. Yeah, um, I'm also really grateful for our teachers and, and leaders who do amazing work as well. Uh, again, I'm optimistic about the preventative work. I think it does create uh, space um, to, to broaden the, the services we can provide because you're spending uh, less time on um, repairs that can be um, prevented. And then also, uh, I think it allows us to repurpose some of our dollars as well. Okay. I'm hoping that we don't have the same conversation in the fall and that the, we can at least say we addressed all the lighting issues. We addressed all the door issues. There just, again, seems to be an opportunity to have small wins to make people feel as though we're making progress because right now, while HVACs are important, that is not uh, what, what teachers and students are feeling and seeing when they're in classrooms that are overheating. Well, I guess that is HVAC issue, uh, but you get my point. Um, I wanna come to uh, contracts. This week, the council voted on a contract for DC Central Kitchen because of a lack of payment. Can you speak to what caused um, them to go so long without payment from DCPS? Yes, yeah, so um, we have been working on, um, you know, our contracts. Um, there were some scenarios in which we determined um, the proper procedures and policies that are in place were not followed. And so we wanted to ensure that we were able to go back. Uh, not then, followed by who? Someone in DCPS? Yes. Yeah, or the, the, part, the, the DCPS uh, Office of uh, Procurement and Contracts. Uh, and so we, we've gone back and done some due diligence with our contracting to ensure that um, they've been thoroughly reviewed and appropriately prepared for council. Uh, and we appreciate the action that council has taken uh, to ensure that that important service with uh, DC Central Kitchen continues for our students. And would you agree that it's a sign that things aren't working with procurement at DCPS, that we had to take that action? Yes, we are working closely with OCP uh, to ter uh, take corrective action uh, with a path forward with how we do acquisition planning, the uh, staffing and personnel structure associated with uh, the office, um, and just ensuring that we are just better um, in terms of how we prepare uh, for acquisition planning and contracts across DCPS. And how many contracts are outstanding, and by that I mean need council approval but have yet to get council approval that you all have acted on? So we're still working with OCP on this, uh, and so we'll be premature to give a number today. Well, the number I think I heard touted amongst my colleagues was that there is upwards of 30 contracts. Does that sound right? Yeah, again, I think it would be premature to try to give a, a finite number on on that today, I think. Let what, me ask this, who makes the decision to initiate a contract? Is that you or is that that procurement office within DCPS that you're saying is not working right? So historically that has been through our office of contract and procurement. And they have the sole authority to make that decision or does it need to come up to your office? Uh, I think those are great questions that we are addressing. Uh, I think that the structure that we had in place um, did not serve us well uh, okay. in terms of, of oversight and, and processes. And so we're continuing to work with OCP. Um, we've been engaged with uh, the review board as well. I'm not giving you an out, but what I think I could be hearing is uh, DCPS is in this place because whoever or that office didn't follow code within the agency and therefore you all had to disregard the law to, by getting council approval just to make sure that schools had things necessary. Is yeah, that I think it's, it's certainly nuanced and okay. um, I think it, it initially um, got murky during a time period where um, we were in the midst of the pandemic and the need to provide critical services in a very urgent manner. Uh, and I think from there, there has been some breakdowns in 
um, you know, how things have been processed and ensuring that protocols are appropriately followed and we've okay. taken corrective actions to address that. One more follow up on this. So when you say you're taking corrective action, we can expect as of today, there should be no more contracts issued by DCPS that don't first come before the council. Yeah, so let me give you back in, in, in Lewis Fairby context. Uh, so you should anticipate that um, contracts going forward um, that are uh, a part of DCPS services will be uh, approved in alignment with the law and with council law. procedures. Yeah, because technically DCPS is breaking the law. And this isn't the first time. And um, it just is starting to seem like a pattern that the agency, the LEA, seems to feel like it can do what it wants. Uh, I would say what was concerning about this is DC Central Kitchen, the both the impact on that vendor, which is embarrassing for both DCPS and the city, but also the services that they were providing. And if that vendor were to say, I'm not going to do business with DCPS anymore, where would that have put the LEA in terms of food services? That's it, it's certainly, um, you know, the failures certainly, you know, create uh, opportunities for us to have uh, gaps in services to students and families is obviously not what we want, uh, which is why we have taken the steps we have to ensure that uh, we have the appropriate, um, you know, protocols and steps in the process. And uh, again, I do want to follow up on your, your statement of that, that, you know, there's a, a culture of of, of you know deliberately not it following seems the that law. Way. It yeah, seems so that way. I, I want to be clear that it is my expectation uh, for myself and our entire team that we are uh, in full compliance of the law. Thank you. That is my time. Thank you, Thank you. Council Member. Um, in that regard, we received a list from your office of, I believe, six contracts that uh, you would like us to pull out for more urgent approval. Uh, I would need from you um, some explanation as to why they should be pulled out. It's my intention that um, when we get the list, which I believe is somewhere between 30 and 36 contracts, that we have a hearing on all of them and uh, what, what's going on. And so I, I'm reluctant to pull any out. I did pull out uh, EC Central Kitchen, and I believe another one is Tama. I'm um, willing to consider that, but I need to receive from you some explanation. We will provide that explanation. Um, um, Thank you, Chairman. And to be clear, explanation, make the argument for why they should be pulled out and acted on. And just simply saying, well, you know, they need the money isn't good enough because everybody needs money. Understood. Um, the, um, could you explain to me why there appear to be several offices that are executive in nature? Uh, but are being funded under the school support department. Uh, for example, the chief of staff and the chief operating officer, I believe that means your chief of staff and the chief operating officer are not in central, but are in school support. So um, general counsel might be another one. Why are these not uh, being budgeted in central? So there may be staff um, in each category that are both central or uh, support. Um, but the, for example, the chief of staff, chief of staff supports multiple teams, uh, which includes our support staff and our office of engagement. Uh, so if it's an executive leader, it could be you know, who they serve and how they serve. And so, for example, with engagement, that office directly supports schools. This is not a convincing argument so far. Yeah, well. There used to be in the law a cap on how much was in central. And so perhaps you would want to shift from central into school support, but we removed that cap. That's part of schools first. So why go through the effort of recategorizing categorizing where this person is? Chief of staff may um, support a number of different functions, but so do you. The last I checked, I think you're budgeted under um, central. Right, I think these are areas in which we look at, you know, how they support schools, how directly they support schools, but it is not a structure or changes are made 
to circumvent um, you know, laws associated with the sure. categories. So I, just, I want to understand why the change was made to begin with. Uh, do you support all schools? I do support okay, all but schools. But you're budgeted under central. And so um, when we changed our organizational structure where executives may supervise different divisions or teams, we look at the function of those teams to determine which category uh, the individual or their supervisor falls in. So for example, in our school support, you will find our curriculum instruction. Um, you know, I'm not asking about that. I'm yeah. asking about the office of the chief of staff and the office of the chief operating officer. You're the yeah. chief operating officer, right? No, I'm not that you're asking me or, um, oh yeah. That's yeah. right. Yes, that is correct. Mm -hmm. So I think for the chief of staff, again, I go back to that example. Uh, they support schools directly that team supports schools directly through our engagement and partnership team, which is a function of schools, which uh, is, is a structure that we're now operating under. Um, earlier, Councilmember Fruman asked about uh, MacArthur High School. Can you give me Following this hearing, would you please provide me with a more detailed plan for the capital improvement of MacArthur? I'm looking at scope. Of, I'm thinking of scope of work by year. We should be able to provide that. Um, I don't think uh, Councilmember Fuman asked the question quite this way. What is your intent with Foxhall Elementary School? Uh, so that project has um, been delayed. Um, we will continue to evaluate enrollment and project a future enrollment to determine our next steps on, on the Foxhall campus. That sort of sounds like in parliamentary parlance, uh, postponed indefinitely. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say indefinitely. I think there's some important uh, information that we will gather from the boundary study. And also I think it's important to see how we continue to uh, recover as it relates to enrollment for those school communities. Uh, we did see um, some uh, the kinds as relate to what we anticipated the projected enrollment to be in those schools. So we want to be sure that we have a clear picture of what to expect from um, those schools in out years as relates to their enrollment. I want to ask you about self-operated food services pilot. Uh, what is the budget for self-operated school food services in the proposed budget? And where do I find it? Yeah, that I'm right. We'll have to follow up on that one. I don't have that line at them and um, okay. Chief Frost is not able to identify it. I'm sorry, this is a budget hearing and you can't identify it? Yeah, we will have to follow up on this request. Where would I find it? Mr. Chairman, my team is pulling that right now. I'll follow up with you while we're here. Okay, I'll come back to that then. Um, Councilor Freeman touched on this, but I, I missed the answer. Um, we heard testimony on, on Wednesday regarding overcrowded classrooms at Merch Elementary School in the first and second grades and at Langley Elementary School in the first grade. How is DCPS rectifying this so that the classrooms comply with the staffing ratios outlined in the WTU contract? Yeah, we are um, committed to review um, the merch situation. 
Um, there, there is um, you know, some concern that has been raised, as you noted, and we, we did listen uh, and heard that testimony. Uh, but Langley, we do have a instructional coach that's supporting first grade. Uh, and then there are additional uh, uh, positions of, of, for those students that are in that cohort that will then go to second grade for next school year. So that's how we're supporting uh, Langley, um, but we'll need more time to look into the situation that um, people reference for merch. Is the answer more teachers or more aides or both? Uh, it could be. Um, we will do a deeper dive into uh, the situation with their instructional superintendent. All right, so you'll get back to me on that. Yes, sir. But Langley, you have a solution, and that is this instructional coach? That is correct. And then next year's solution is to add an additional uh, second grade class. For next year? Correct. Um, Although under schools, first Langley is $135,000 short for next year. But your testimony is that next year, Langley will have an additional classroom teacher. Correct, for the cohort of students that are currently in first grade, that'll be in second grade next year. Will the calculations for the school first that you're referencing be publicly available? I'll be happy to share them with you. Thank you. Be happy to share them though with you. Thank you. So I think that's my first follow-up item. About six for you, one for me. Um, Uh, there was considerable testimony the other day about um, um, budgeting for teacher wellness, $750,000 for teacher wellness. What's your reaction to that? Yeah, I think we have um, worked with the WTU to identify resources uh, for staff as relates to you know, what DCPS offers. I think we also need to continue to ensure that people are aware of what's available to them as a part of the benefits structure for DCPS. Uh, and um, we're also interested in continuing to ensure that there are um, mindfulness opportunities and other activities that can be led by school leaders on their, on their staff to ensure that also that there's space for um, wellness and mental health uh, in their buildings. Sounds like what you're saying is that you've got it covered. No, I wouldn't say that. I think it's it's an area where we continue to grow and, and learn. And it's been an area of focus for me and my teacher advisory team and, and taking suggestions and ideas of how we might be responsive. I think one of the areas where um, there is, you know, common interest and it's been raised and, you know, previous testimony is around how we create um, schedules that could be a little bit more flexible in terms of uh, the time that teachers have for planning and other activities, I think would help uh, balance their work and life demands. And that's something that we've also expressed interest in in the partnering with education resource strategies, which is a leader in this area and other experts of how we might um, be responsive. I think the concern that I have is we just want to balance the the need for providing flexibility with also ensuring that students are also able to get what they need in terms of direct instruction from adults as well. Uh, sounds like you're answering the, my next question, which is your reaction to advocates call for flexible scheduling. Yeah, I think- So wellness was access to mental health counsel. Uh, flexible scheduling is flexible scheduling. Mm -hmm. So on the wellness, they were advocating for $750,000. What's your reaction? And now that I've clarified um, the flexible scheduling, what's your reaction? I forget how much, I think there were different proposals. Yeah, I think for, you know, the wellness, I mean, there, there's access to 
um, you know, mental health professionals through the benefit structure that we offer. Uh, I think, you know, creating a separate structure may not yield the level of service, the outcomes I think that they're seeking, but happy to have that conversation. Uh, in terms of the flexible schedule, I think it's mutual interest and in continue to explore that. We have had some uh, exploration into that this school year as a part of our DCXQ structure for the high school redesign, which will be in the first year next year for Cardozo and uh, for Dunbar. Um, but again, my caution is just I want to be sure that as we think about that flexibility, that it doesn't result in less direct instructional time for our students as we think about the schedule. I also think we have to be mindful for uh, parents and guardians of how it may impact their schedule. So, for example, you know, we have explored options such as, you know, more half days in our schedule, um, more early release time uh, for students. So we also want to be mindful of the impact that would have for families as they would potentially need to coordinate child care and the like. But there's certainly common interest in how we can um, be more flexible. I think one of the asks that we may ask of council uh, is uh, to reevaluate the regulations as relates to instructional days and time, um, which could create an avenue for greater flexibility. Um, my understanding is that in the budget book for Ellington School, there's something like $9.7 million budgeted. I did talk with you the other day. There's some additional money for Ellington? Yes, so we discussed that um, there's an additional allocation to be paid in the budget of approximately $2.6 million. Uh, which we believe would fulfill our obligations to uh, Duke Ellington as relates to their budget for the. And where is that money found? That let me check where our team. I believe that is in a uh, central services set aside, and I, it's in the Office of Social Emotional Academic Development, which we refer to as C which is the academic office of a DCPS. What's the office again? Uh, the Office of Social Emotional Academic Development. And that is where most of our academic um, items are as it relates to line items associated with teaching and learning curriculum, everything focused on academics and emotional development. I wrote down social, emotional, academic development. Uh, so Mr. Ross, what's the answer on food nutrition services? The budget for that is 3.9 million. 3.9? That is correct. And it's embedded in the FNS uh, line item. What line? It's, in, it's embedded in the FNS uh, budget. It's not a specific line item unto itself. Is the funding adequate to maintain the current number of schools? Yes. Expand the number of schools? Potentially, yes. What does that mean? It means we would have to make a business case and decision that we would want to expand, which we're currently assessing, but we do think that we could fund that if we decided to do it. How many schools are funded now? I Seven. think it's Seven, I have a note here, eight, it's seven? It's seven. So if you wanted to increase it to nine, the funding is there? We believe so, yes. The 13? I should have phrased this question differently. <laughs> uh, but we would have to come back to you and yeah, say specifically how far we could go, but we do think if we wanted to expand incrementally, we could do so. That would resemble the same, the last expansion where we went from five to seven or we could do something similar. Do you think the program's a success? Yeah, from my vantage point, um, there has been you know lots of positive feedback, but there are some situations where we have 
receive critical feedback. And so I think it is a promising solution, but I still think there's work to do uh, to ensure that it is um, meeting the needs of our students and also providing healthy and tasty choices. So these are schools where um, there's a kitchen in the school and there is staff at the school that can prepare meals. That is correct. And which would you prefer, Chancellor, that I sit here and hold up a plate of a self-operated school food and nutrition service lunch or a, I won't name the contractor lunch that I showed you at the last one? Yeah, I mean, I think those are a great examples of, of, you know, where the central service kitchens have functioned well. I, I, I wouldn't say that that's always the experience in every site. And so it is something that I think could be a solution. Um, but, you know, there are other considerations. I think, you know, Chief Ross point about the business proposition of it because, you know, the decision was made at one point in time to, you know, remove all of the equipment in the kitchen. And so a significant amount of investment would be need to be made. And I think we just have to evaluate that investment. I also um, believe you know that we are um, taking the food service contract out the bid. And so I think our service that we are receiving today may look very different than the service that we are receiving uh, in the future. So we look forward to what that um, competition and solicitation will bring DCPS as relates to option for food service. And we may find that that is a, a viable option for the future. Well, I'll answer my own question. I'd rather have the self-operated food. And I recognize that they're fairly restrictive requirements with regard to meeting nutritional standards. And so there might be a challenge there. But I think I would still prefer the self-operated food service to the contractor. Just saying, I think, uh, and I think council members are of a view that if done right, it will be less expensive than the uh, contracts and um, more enjoyable to the student. Give me a second. impact. So um, there's a, a table in the uh, budget book regarding WTU member salary components. And it lists a number of things which I'm guessing are outlined in the WTU contract. I'd like to better understand what the contract says with regard to impact, especially since if I remember correctly, the law precludes teacher evaluation from being part of a collective bargaining agreement? Yeah, uh, impact is not considered in the WTU contract. Okay, so the contract's just silent about impact. Correct. It's probably so that that could be a contract. Um, give me a second here. Uh, I don't have any other questions for you. Somebody took notes on what you're getting back to us with? Yes, Ms. Noth is taking copious notes and we'll follow up accordingly. Okay, and uh, I have one piece to follow up and that's our school's first calculation. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, thank you, Chancellor. Uh, that's gonna conclude this hearing. This has been uh, the sixth hearing of the Committee of the Whole on the proposed budgets by proposed by the mayor for Agencies under the purview of the Committee of the Whole. 
for the fiscal year beginning October 1st. We will have our next hearing on April 14th, which will be on uh, broadly the all the legislation that uh, the mayor submitted on March 22nd with regard to the budget, such as the Local Budget Act, the Budget Support Act, and so forth, not limited to the agencies under the committee as a whole. Again, I believe that's February, excuse me, April 14th. The time is 7.16 p.m. and this hearing is adjourned.